Diana was unbearably bored. All day long, she had to devote herself only to her two-year-old daughter. Was that what she was aiming for when she was so diligently wooing the rich and promising John? Diana had succeeded. She married him. But it wasn't how she'd envisioned a wealthy family life. In Diana's dreams, it looked different. She imagined how Mary will travel abroad, dine only in expensive restaurants, visit beauty salons, and lying by the pool, sipping cocktails. In reality, it didn't work out that way. John worked all day, and yes, she was not mistaken. He was a very promising young man. He had recently purchased a large two-story cottage in an elite area of the city. However, the repair was not yet finished, and even now on the second floor of the incessant drilling, knocking workers, talking in an incomprehensible language. Immediately after the wedding, John insisted on having a child, which Diana was not ready for. She has long tried to persuade her husband to live for himself, but the man was adamant. At the time of the wedding, he was 30 years old, and he was ready for fatherhood. But Diana was only 22, and she wanted to flutter and enjoy life. It didn't work out. A year later, Alice was born, and Diane had to immerse herself in endless diapers, diapers and formula. Sleepless nights and baby sores drove the girl crazy. John, on principle, did not hire a nanny to help Michael. He turned out to be a good husband, caring and generous, but at the same time, too authoritarian. The man had his own principles and he never deviated from them. One of these principles was that he believed that the young wife should watch over her daughter only herself. My mom raised me without any nannies. That's why we had such a close bond until the day she died. And you'll be fine. So tell me, what else do you have to do? We hired an au pair. No cooking, no cleaning. Just devote yourself to your daughter dying. That's easy to say, devote yourself. Every day is Groundhog Day. Diana hated even going to the park, where there was a big playground. That's where all the rich moms in the neighborhood usually gathered. At first, Diana was happy to get to know them all, hoping to socialize with them. But socializing with them was just talking about the kids. Diana was sick of it. If it were up to her, she wouldn't shove her nose on the playground. But John insisted on daily walks, saying the baby needed fresh air. Of course he needed fresh air, Diana grumbled, gathering her daughter for a walk. Then he would walk by himself, among these clutches. Happy Alice grabbed her sandbox set and a ball. The girl did not fit all this in her hands and she, frowning her eyebrows, looked at her mother. Alice, let's take one thing, either a ball or a set. The girl hardly spoke yet but she was good at the word no. Diana sighed unhappily, took the ball in her hands and went to the exit of the cottage. On the one hand, getting out into the fresh air now was better than being among the endless sounds of the renovation. Diana and her daughter had just left the gate when a tin car pulled up sharply beside them. Diana's excited friend Anna jumped out of it. Diana, hi. It's so great that I managed to catch you. Look, with what guys I met, Anna led her eyes in the direction of the car, from the windows of which two handsome guys were smiling. We're going to the beach now. Come with us. Diana was horrified. John would kill me if he found out. How would he find out? You'll be home before he gets home. If anything, you can tell him you got held up walking your daughter in the park. Alice won't give us away, will she? Anna winked at the little girl, knowing she wasn't talking yet. Diana hesitated. On the one hand, she really wanted to have fun with these cute guys, but on the other hand, she was afraid that her husband might find out. The girl was silent, thinking, and Anna hurried her. Diana, let's go. Don't let me down. I said I'd be with a friend. The guys are shopping for the picnic. They got champagne for you and me. I don't know what to think. Just get in the car. Okay. Diana's making up her mind. Is it okay that I'm with child? I told the guys you're a young mom. It's okay. Alice can play on the beach. What difference does it make to her where she builds her dollies? Diana nodded and taking her daughter in her arms went to the tent. She sat on the back seat, met the guys and asked them to stop by the store on the way to buy juice and cookies for her daughter. The girl needed something to do too. The guys drove to a remote beach where Diana had never been before. Wow, she exclaimed, getting out of the car and lowering her daughter onto the sandy beach. What a steep shore here. Yes, nodded one of the guys. It's pretty dangerous in this place. I'll tell you more. 
There's a whirlpool under that steep shore. You can get sucked in in no time. We won't swim there. We'll swim here, where there's a gentle slope. At least it's less crowded. Imagine how crowded the city beaches are now. There's nowhere to spit. Diana agreed with that. Going to a crowded beach in the company of guys, a married girl does not need to. And here, in fact, it was not crowded. Apart from their company, there was only a young married couple with a boy of about five years old. The wife was in an old faded swimsuit, long out of fashion, and the couple had nothing on the bedspread except a water bottle. How did they get here? Anna asked in a whisper, I don't see a car. They probably came on foot, grinned one of the guys, taking bags of food and drinks out of the trunk. All right, let's get away from them and start getting settled. Girls, there's a blanket over there, lay it down. In half an hour, the merry company, which had time to swim, was laughing. The guys, despite the fact that one of them was driving, drank strong alcohol, and Diana and Anna sipped champagne coquettishly. Diana didn't regret in the slightest that she had agreed to this trip. It had been fun with the guys. And Alice, apparently, was not bored. The beach was sandy and the girl did her favorite thing. Armed with a set for the sandbox, little girl diligently tried to mold figures. Bacham, a little shy, a boy approached her, the son of the vacationers in the neighborhood. Alice smiled and handed him her trowel. When the boy took it, the girl ran to her mom and pointed to the juice box. Diana stuck a tube in it and handed the juice to her daughter. Alice went back to her new friend and generously handed him the juice, but then the mom pulled the girl back. Alice, don't let the boy drink from your tube. You can't do that. What if he's sick? The boy's parents heard this shout and looked at each other. I should have bought Michael some lemonade, the young woman sighed. The man nodded sullenly at her. Georgia shivered slightly under the appraising glances of the girls in the neighboring company. Her husband jumped up from his seat and took Michael by the hand and walked toward the river. He offered to take a swim, but she didn't feel like it. She felt uncomfortable when the girl forbade her daughter to share her juice with George's son, and they only had a bottle of water with them. It's understandable, the family was desperately short of money. Georgia and her husband Steve had recently bought a one-room apartment and had gotten into huge debts. To pay off these debts, Steve worked like a curse, grabbed any part-time job, and when he was offered a callum on the replacement of the roof in one of the houses of the private sector, the young man happily grabbed it. Of course, safety in such places was completely absent, and Steve did not hold on to the roof and collapsed, suffering injuries. It took him several months to recover, and he was unable to work during that time. George's nurse's salary was barely enough to pay the rent and buy a rudimentary set of groceries, and the family still had to pay for kindergarten, buy him clothes, and wanted to treat the child sometimes, which unfortunately happened less and less often. Steve didn't work, debts were piling up, but Georgia didn't despair. Nothing. Steve is a very hard-working man and is almost well. Pretty soon he'll be back to work and the family will be back on their feet, paying off their debts. Today Georgia had a rare day off and she wanted to get away with her beloved family. They'd chosen this normally deserted beach to get away from people. It didn't matter that it was a 40-minute walk to the beach. As luck would have it, this rowdy bunch of guys rolled in and ruined George's mood. She knew one of the guys visually. He'd gone to the same school as her and lived not far from her parents. The rest of the merrymakers were unfamiliar to Georgia. The girl immediately noticed the arrogant, appraising look the girl's mom gave her and she felt a little ashamed of her old swimsuit. Well, so be it. Immediately restrained Georgia. Let me wear a swimsuit of a hundred years ago but next to my beloved husband and son. I'm happy with them and someday we'll have everything. The company was walking very cheerfully, noisily splashing in the river, loudly clinking, laughing. The little girl was left to herself, and it was evident that she was very glad when Michael joined her in her games. But then the girl's mother shouted at her and Georgia realized that the rest was ruined. Steve, I'm tired. Why don't we go home? She said quietly to her husband. The man looked at her shrewdly. He understood his wife with half a word. Well, let's have one last rinse. Are you coming? Georgia shook her head in the negative and Steve, shouting to the sun, went with him to the river. After a while, Diana, who was already quite tipsy, 
noticed that the couple resting in the neighborhood began to gather. Oh, at last, she wrinkled her pretty nose. Finally, they are leaving. I do not like that my Alice with this boy plays. They are like that. What are they like? Asked Diana, one of the guys with whom she was having fun. I know this girl. I went to school with her. She's all right. And her husband seems to be quite normal. Diana shrugged uncertainly and turned away from the couple. Let's have a drink, she said cheerfully and grabbed a shot glass with strong alcohol, as they had long since finished the champagne with Anna. The girl Alice stood on the sand and sadly watched her new acquaintance, a boy Michael, taken away from the beach by his mom and dad. The girl kicked the ball with all her might, and it rolled down the beach and rolled down a steep cliff. Alice ran after the ball. The girl ran up to the cliff. The ball was not visible. Alice carelessly hung down, trying to see it in the water. Through the loud laughter, no one but Anna heard a slight shriek and a splash of water. Anna looked around and didn't immediately realize that something was wrong. When she did, she shouted loudly, Diana, where's Alice? Where is your daughter? Diana looked around with a dazed look. Where is she? Where did she go? She didn't run away. She fell in the water. I heard a splash. As if on cue, the whole group jumped to their feet and ran to the steep bank. There were circles in the water, and in the center of those circles Alice's ball floated orphaned. Diana abruptly began to sober up and was thrown into hysterics. Alice, daughter, I can't swim, somebody jump in. Save my daughter, the girl threw herself on the guy's chests. But her new acquaintances stood there with their eyes down. They had warned in advance about the whirlpool in this place and they didn't want to drown because of a girl they didn't know and her child. Diana howled and tried to push the boys to the shore to save Alice, but they froze in place. And then, past the standing guys and the girl struggling between them, a male figure flashed by lightning and dived into the water. Steve, what are you doing? There was a shout behind them. It was Georgia literally dragging her son by the hand. She and her husband hadn't gotten far before they heard Diana howling. Steve instantly realized what was going on and reacted with lightning speed. Georgia and Michael ran to the shore and now, along with the others, kept their eyes on the water closing over Steve. The time dragged on for an agonizingly long time. It was only a few seconds, but it seemed an eternity to those standing on the shore. It was little Michael who was the first to fall. The boy roared loudly and began to call for his father. Then Georgia screamed. Panic grew. The girl's head appeared on the surface of the water with her eyes closed. Steve came up next, struggling to breathe and trying to push the little girl out of the maelstrom. It was obvious that the man was exhausted. The boys on the shore fussed. They scrambled down and getting as far into the water as they could, held out their hands to the girl. Steve pushed the little girl toward them as hard as he could and disappeared under the water in the same second. Diana ran around the shore around her pale daughter, who was being given CPR by Anna, and ignored the wailing Georgia, whose husband had not come out of the water. Alice coughed and opened her eyes. Diana exhaled, grabbed her daughter in her arms, held her tightly against her. The girl cried. Only then did Diana look at Georgia running along the shore and almost tearing her hair out. What about her husband? One of the boys shook his head mournfully, lowering his eyes. That was it. He didn't swim out. I guess his strength's gone. Should we call whoever we're supposed to call in these cases? Police? Divers? How do we call them? Diana was confused. Then everyone will know. Find out what? The guy didn't understand. That we were here. My husband will know. No, I can't let that happen. You call whoever you want. I'm calling a cab and I'm leaving. Diana, what are you doing? That man drowned to save your daughter, and he saved her, a dazed Anna exclaimed. And I'm grateful to him for that. Diana cut him off, but my husband mustn't know anything about it. The bewildered Georgia floundered on the shore. The girl hardly realized what was happening and did not notice the moment when the cab left the beach with her daughter. It still seemed to Georgia that Steve was about to surface and she ran, keeping her eyes on the water. When the police arrived, she begged them to get her husband out and Michael roared loudly as he sat on the sand. At some point, 
Georgia came to her senses, walked over to her son and slumped down beside him and put her arm around his shoulders. Don't cry, son. Daddy will be all right. He must have surfaced somewhere else. The girl herself believed what she was telling her son. How could it be any other way? She couldn't think of any other outcome. They can't be without Steve. They just can't. And he can't just leave them alone. After a while, the policeman began to insist that Georgia should go home and the search should continue here without her. The girl shook her head stubbornly, sitting on the sand and hugging her son. She began to sway, as if in a trance from side to side. One of the policemen, wanting to bring the girl to her senses, said to her rather rudely, Stop thinking about yourself and think about your child. Look at your son. Why should he see all this? These words sobered Georgia a little and she looked at Michael. The boy couldn't cry anymore. He whimpered like a frightened kitten, clinging to his mother's side and staring at the river with swollen slits in his eyes. Yes, Michael, come on. I'll take you to Grandma's. Then I'll be back. She turned to the policeman. Back as soon as I take the baby to his mom. Steve wasn't found until the third day, when his body floated to the surface. Diane was waiting for her husband to come home from work. In the last few days, she had been such a good wife, just a goody-goody. In fact, the girl was very scared. Every day, she called her friend Anna and found out how the search for the man who had saved her daughter was progressing. Strictly Nastrigo Diana had instructed Anna to keep silent about their presence on the beach. Although, of course, both the police and the lifeguards were aware that the man they were looking for was a hero who had saved a child at the cost of his own life. But the mother of this child did not want publicity and left before the police arrived on the scene. Well, that's her right. No one could force gratitude. Still, Diana was shaking. Every day, when her husband returned from work, the first thing she did was to look anxiously into his face to see if he had found out anything. The girl realized that she was guilty on all sides. She went to the beach with strange guys, drank with them and poorly washed her daughter. Yes, what a sin to say, Diana at that moment was a lot of fun and at times she even forgot that Alice was playing nearby. But then again, even in those thoughts, Diana managed to blame her husband. It was his own fault. Locked her here, in four walls with a child, no rest, no respite. So she went off the rails. Obviously, John wouldn't accept that excuse. What would he do if he knew the truth? Divorced her the same day, at the very least. Diana was sure of that, knowing well the resolute temper of her husband. He'd also be able to sue for his daughter on the basis of what had happened. Diana shuddered at the thought. Don't think about bad things. Everything will be fine. Anna would keep quiet. It was her fault, and the boys knew nothing about Diana. Through the window opened on the first floor, Diana heard her husband's car drive into the yard. The girl put on a smile, fixed a beautiful bow on her daughter's head and ran to meet her husband. Oh, John, you're earlier than usual today. Alice and I missed you. Haven't we, Alice? John smiled dutifully at Michael, absorbed in his own thoughts, and at dinner he was quite distracted, nodding occasionally at Diana's incessant chatter. John, what are you always thinking about? My wife couldn't stand it. Do you even listen to what I'm telling you? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was just thinking. I heard a story today. A man drowned in our town four days ago. They pulled him out yesterday. No, I haven't heard Diana's tense. Well, drowned and drowned, it happens. Why do you care so much? It's just the details. The man rushed to save someone else's child, a girl, I think. He managed to save her, pushed her to the surface, but he ran out of strength and drowned. Can you imagine? Well done, what can I say, Diana shrugged. He's not just a good man, John said indignantly. The man is a hero. I keep thinking, yes, many people would give their lives for their own child. John looked at Alice, but for someone else's. Let's say, would I be able to throw myself into the maelstrom for someone else's child like him? I don't know, I'm not sure. It's a very dangerous place and everyone knows it. That man knew it too, and he deliberately took the risk for someone else's girl. I admire people like that. Diana sat there, dead or alive. How unpleasant this conversation was for her. She really wanted to change the subject, but John wouldn't let her. No, but you know what the best part is. 
The mom of the rescue girl took her daughter and left the shore right after the man drowned. She didn't wait for the rescuers, nor did she express her gratitude to this Michael, who was also there by the way. Nothing. Nobody knows who she is. The only rumor is that she was drunk and didn't take care of her child. It was entirely her fault that the girl fell into the river. So drunk, Diana muttered angrily, I don't know how life happens. John, we don't know all the details. Let's not judge anyone. I am. John said defiantly, I do judge a mother like that. She goes to the river with a little kid and drinks there. She's probably from a dysfunctional background and unmarried. A normal woman wouldn't act like that. And that man had a family, a small son, they say they were already poor, and now they were left without a breadwinner. And for whom, you ask yourself? Some naughty mom. The more her husband got angry, the colder Diana got. It's even worse than she thought. I can't imagine what her husband would do if he found out she was his wife. John, what if you and I were to take a trip somewhere? Diana blurted out. No, but seriously, you and I had a lot of fun. We didn't go on a wedding trip. Then Alice was born. Let's go on vacation. Okay, let's try it. John suddenly agreed. Tomorrow I'll go to work and try to solve the most important issues. Maybe we'll go to the sea, if only for a while. The next day Diana was not herself. She couldn't wait for John to come home from work, and her anxiety was growing. She wanted to get out of town before this story died down. Her husband had gotten a little too emotional about the so-called hero's behavior. Diane called her husband to see if he had been able to settle the important issues and if the trip would take place. When John reassured her, Diana happily rushed to the second floor to pack her things. Just then, the all pair called out to her, Diana, there's a girl at the gate asking for you. What girl? Diana was surprised. It was Sveka again. She jumped out and with a quick step, reached the gate and opened it. All the blood drained from Diana's face when she saw who stood before her. It was Georgia, the drowned man's wife. How did you find me? Diana hissed at Georgia, closing the gate tightly behind her. One of the guys you were on the beach with told me the address. He and I went to the same school. Georgia answered in a weak, quiet voice. She was staggering and dark circles under her eyes. She couldn't remember the last time she'd eaten or if she'd eaten at all since her husband's death. But Diana didn't care about the appearance of this grief-stricken girl. She was only angry. Angry that Georgia had come to her house. What do you want? Why did you come here? She asked her rudely. Georgia didn't seem to notice the aggression directed at her and continued to talk quietly. You know, Steve was just found yesterday. His body. Now it's a funeral, and I don't have any money to bury him. We don't have any money. Not me. Not my mom. There's no one to turn to. We already owe everyone. Steve didn't work for a while. He was sick. What's it got to do with me? Why did you come to me? It was only now that Georgia began to realize how rude Diana was being to her. She looked up, scrutinizing her face. I thought maybe you could help me with money. I'll give it back. Not right away, but I'll give it back. Oh, that's it. You've come to beg for money. You think because your husband died for my daughter, I owe you money? Did I ask him to do that? It was only his decision. He couldn't assess his own strength. Couldn't get out. Whose fault is that? All right, well, just stay here. I'll be right back. Diana ran into the house and Georgia stood puzzled. This was not the reaction she'd expected from the rescue girl's mom. Oh, not this. Georgia knew that if someone had saved Michael, she would have given that person everything she had and been grateful to the end of her life. And all she'd come to Diana for was alone. While Georgia was pondering, Diana jumped out of the gate and shoved a couple of crumpled bills into the girl's sweaty palm. Here, take these. I won't give you any more, and don't come here. You hear me? You don't have to give anything back, but don't ever show your face here again. And don't you dare implicate me in your husband's death. He took a dive, he drowned. Nobody pushed him into the river. Georgia stared into Diana's face with wide open eyes. She didn't even look at the denomination of the bills now clutched in her hand, but raised her hand and threw them at Diana's face with fury. Choke on your hand out. I don't know what my husband would have done knowing what you were like. He probably would have died for the girl anyway. That was Steve's thing. But except that I, if it were possible to rewind time, would never have let him jump in the river. 
I have hung a rock around his neck and held him down, wouldn't have led him. Georgia turned and walked away from the gate, and Diana picked up the bills from the ground and ran into the house, looking around cautiously to see if anyone had seen the scene. A couple days later, Steve's funeral was held. There were a lot of people there, and they were mostly strangers who didn't care. Many people in town had heard how the young man had died, and contrary to George's expectations, the funeral was decent. People who learned about the difficult material Paula McClaya of the hero's family began to bring his wife money. They brought free of charge, who can bring as much as they can, from the world by the thread, as they say. The largest sum was brought to the girl from a businessman who wished to remain anonymous. The girl could not believe how many people around her cared and was immensely grateful to them. But the loss of her husband was very hard for her. For the first year, the girl lived as if in a trance, floating along the stream, not noticing anything and no one around except for her son. Money was constantly lacking, debts had not gone anywhere, and despite Steve's death, they had to be paid. Georgia worked 24 hours a day, taking a nursing job. She pulled the strain forgetting about herself and seeing the child only at night, but at the same time trying to make sure that he had everything he needed. Michael went to school, and despite the fact that his mother never had time to do his homework with him, he studied very well. The boy became independent early. Being with him in public Georgia often caught envious glances of her son in the direction of children proudly walking with their dads. When Michael was nine years old, a patient with an attack of appendicitis was admitted to the hospital where Georgia worked. This man was much older than Georgia, but nevertheless immediately began to give signs of attention to the young nurse. At first the girl only waved away from such an intrusive bow, but then she thought. And why not? The man seems to be not bad, divorced. According to him, he's very fond of children, and Michael needs a man's attention. Georgia made up her mind and tried to introduce the man, whose name was Dustin, to her son. She was very nervous bringing a man into the house for the first time. Contrary to her fears, Michael took to Dustin calmly and even joyfully. The boy told his new acquaintance passionately about his schoolwork, and he listened attentively, shaking his head respectfully. Georgia exhaled with relief. So that's the way it's going to be. Michael would need a father. And she could stop working around the clock and spend more time with her son. It's so wonderful to have a strong male shoulder to lean on. In three months, Georgia and Happy Michael moved into Dustin's apartment. It was a rather spacious two-bedroom apartment in which the boy finally had his own room. Dustin was very kind and attentive, but only for the time being. As time went on, Georgia began to notice that the child was annoying her new man. Michael was so attracted to him and was ready to call him daddy, but apparently his stepfather didn't want him to. Call me Uncle Dustin. I'm not your daddy. You're not a little boy. You understand everything. Dustin snapped at the boy, and Michael shrank back. Everything seemed to be the same, except that now Michael didn't run to his stepfather to brag about his success in school and tell him about his affairs. Dustin seemed to enjoy it. Over time, Georgia began to realize that this man needs more of a mistress in the house, who will cook, clean, and the child was in his way. And one day, far from being a beautiful day, Georgia returned from her shift and from the doorstep heard her son crying. The woman rushed into the room and saw Michael standing in the corner. His legs were covered in red stripes and his belt was lying next to him. Dustin, smirking smugly, sat in a chair. Oh, you're here? Listen to what your son has done. Georgia didn't want to hear anything. The blood rushed to her head. The woman grabbed the belt that was lying on the floor and threw herself at the man, trying to whip him as hard as she could. She failed, of course. A small, angry woman jumping with a belt in her hands near a tall man looked silly. Not expecting such a violent reaction, Dustin intercepted Georgia's arm. What are you so mad about? He's a boy, and boys are supposed to be raised. It wasn't a big deal. I whipped his ass. My father used to whip my ass like that when I was a kid. That's why I grew up to be a man. Georgia cried. She threw the belt away and ran to her son, who was still roaring in the corner. Michael, Michael, come on. We're going back to our apartment right now. You will never see that man again. After her failed affair with Dustin, Georgia had stopped looking at men altogether. 
The young woman had come to believe that strangers could never treat her son as their own, and she didn't want to worry about whether her new husband had hurt Michael. Besides, Georgia hadn't been able to get rid of Dustin for quite some time. After she and Michael had left, he'd initially stopped the woman, begging her to come back, saying he'd made a mistake and would never lay a finger on the child again. But Georgia did not even consider the option of returning. She has a strong aversion to Dustin. It turned out to be not all surprises on the man's part. Once he was convinced that the woman had left him for good, he showed his true, vindictive, vindictive nature. Dustin began filing complaints about Georgia to the head doctor as an incompetent medical professional, and he also stalked her co-workers and told them nasty things about the woman. Georgia was shocked by these behaviors, but Dustin didn't accomplish anything with it. Georgia was too well known at work to believe the ravings of an offended man. All of these events only reinforced Georgia's belief that she shouldn't consider men as potential husbands. She should devote herself to Michael, which she did. Georgia got back on her feet and started working around the clock to provide for her son. The woman's life resembled a daily struggle for survival, but her son pleased her as he grew up a boy smart, kind, fair. He's a lot like Steve. Georgia often thought, only, is that a good thing? What did my husband's kindness lead to? To leaving us alone for the happiness of another man's family. It was that very family that Georgia saw in all its glory. Early one morning, she was coming back from another part-time job, tired. She had only a few hours to sleep and then back to the hospital. And then a large white car pulled up not far from her. Georgia didn't know much about cars, but even from the look of it, she could tell that it was very expensive. A man got out of the car first, and Georgia didn't pay him any attention until Diana stepped out of the passenger door. Georgia recognized her immediately, in a flash. That hateful face seemed to have gotten even more beautiful. Why prettier? It was just better groomed. Now seeing Diana, the only expression that came to mind was gorgeous woman. Meanwhile, the man stepped to the back door of the car, and having opened it, helped the girl to get out. Alice was wearing a beautiful pink coat and white boots. Georgia's heart skipped a beat and she fixed her gaze on the child's face. It was because of this girl that her beloved husband was not in the world right now. Steve had given his life for her. Now she lit us and he doesn't, and it could have been the other way around. How many times had Georgia replayed in her mind the events of that fateful day? Had they left then, just a few minutes earlier, and things would have gone differently. Steve would be alive and Michael would be growing up with a full family. And the woman herself wouldn't have had to work around the clock to feed her child. Steve. The woman's eyes filled with tears at the memory of him. How much she had loved him. He was probably the only man she could love in her life. Beautiful and happy as they looked, the family disappeared behind the doors of a store and Georgia watched them go. She hated Diana, but worst of all, and she couldn't help it, she seemed to hate the girl too. Her mind knew that the child was innocent, but her heart fluttered at the sight of this pretty little girl whose life her husband had given his own. Diana shrugged her shoulders shakily. She hadn't noticed Georgia, but she could feel the hateful stare directed at her back. Diana was already angry. Today, John had decided to take the day off, and instead of taking her to a restaurant, instead of devoting it to Michael, for example, he'd taken her and his daughter to a children's clothing store. Although Alice's closets are already overflowing with clothes. What's a baby need? She's growing up and some things do not even have time to wear once. And John liked to pamper the girl, dressing her up in expensive things, giving her toys without measure. What else can he do? Grinned Diana. He won't have any other children. At least he's made peace with that. As soon as Alice was a little older, her husband began to insist on having a second child. John wanted a son, he just wanted a son. And Diana was horrified at the suggestion. What child? She only had Alice off her hands. Diana exhaled, being able to take time for herself. And here it was again. The mere thought of sleepless nights with a baby in diapers terrified Diana. No, she didn't want that to happen again. She's not a soul after all, to give birth on demand. She wanted to live and live beautifully. Obviously, if Diana told her husband about it, he would only freak out, so she decided to do the trick here. For a long time, the woman pretended that she could not get pregnant, diligently protecting herself, secretly from John. 
Then she got herself a fake checkup. In reality, the woman paid the head doctor of the gynecology clinic for the report she needed and with a sorrowful expression on her face, handed it to her husband. What is this? John asked. I do not understand anything in these medical terms. Explain in Russian what it says here. It says here that I can never be a mother again. You see, I won't be able to get pregnant again. That can't be. The man exclaimed. What kind of diagnosis do you have? Everything can be cured nowadays if you pay well. If necessary, you will be treated abroad. It's not curable. It's not curable. Diana shouted, trying to cry. The woman pretended to be hysterical. What do you think? I didn't recognize it. What do you think it's like for me to get a diagnosis like that? I wanted a baby so badly. What's going to happen now? You're going to leave me? Diana pretended to shake with sobs, covering her face with the palms of her hands, her eyes completely dry. Through the slits in her fingers, she watched her confused husband's reaction. Diana, really? Why would I leave you because you're sick? Don't be silly. But uh, maybe we could try. No, no, Diane shrieked. I've been assured there's no cure. John hugged his wife reassuringly, deciding to return to this conversation a little later, when she had calmed down. He had no reason not to believe Diana, though. Well, what kind of woman would attribute infertility to herself in the middle of nowhere? Diana was, in principle, satisfied with the result of her performance. And when, after a while, John tried to return to this conversation again, again through a tantrum, and that's how she made her husband forget about the second child. And yet, Diana was sure that her husband would never leave her because he loved his only daughter too much. So let him be content with her. And Diana herself has other worries. Her personal life. Diana's light flirtation with a fitness trainer recently turned into a relationship, and she plunged into it with her head. Starting this relationship, Diana was shaking a lot. It was the first time she cheated on her husband. Well, on the other hand, what does John want, disappearing all day at work? Diane is young and beautiful, and men are paying attention to her. Diane was freaking out. Once again, her meeting with her new, young boyfriend had fallen through. John asked her to take Alice to the electronics store and pick out a new smartphone for her birthday. Her daughter's birthday was two weeks ago, though. It's just that Alice wasn't happy with the gift. Here the father and succumbed to the persuasion of the girl decided to give her a smartphone. Girls, Diana grinned. The daughter is already quite an adult bidding guys. Diana should know that. It was John who thought her daughter was still young. And Diana felt her daughter was her competition. Of course she did, because her last lover was only a little older than her daughter. And yet he has no idea how old she really is. Before leaving the house, Diana cast a fleeting glance in the mirror. She looks great. How could one guess her real age here? What a young beauty she is. Diane hurried on seeing that her daughter was already waiting for her in the car with John's driver. That asshole could go off on her own. Although where can she go without money? Mom said Alice when the woman got into the car. Maybe I'll drive myself. I know you have no desire to ride with me. Give me the money, I'll grab my friend and we'll pick out a smartphone with her. The girl squinted slyly. No way, sighed Diana. Dad said to go together, so let's go. In the store, Alice went straight to the most expensive gadgets. We should think. Hum, Diana, we do not consider the cheap ones. This one poked her daughter's finger at the latest model of iPhone. Mom, buy this one, but make sure it's gold colored. Young man, Diana called the sales consultant, please come over. Calling the guy Diana thought to just give him instructions to make a purchase, but when he came closer and the woman saw him, decided to do something else. We want to buy this smartphone. Tell us about its features. The guy spoke and Diana admired how young and handsome he was. No, really very handsome. Wavy black hair arranged in a fashionable hairstyle and the eyes. You only see eyes like that in the movies. They seem to radiate light. Diana used all her tricks and flirted with the salesman, not noticing that her own daughter also keeps her eyes on this guy. The guy, on the other hand, only noticed the girl. He was inexperienced in the games of adult women and saw the girl's admiring gaze at once. Oh, you explain everything so well. It's rare to find such competent salesmen. I'll probably become your regular customer, cooed Diana, when the guy made the purchase. 
We are always happy to see you in our store, smiled the salesman on duty. Walking from the hip, Diana moved to the exit of the store. A disheveled Alice walked beside her. Near the door, she turned around to see the guy she liked once again. Her cheeks flushed when she saw that the salesman was also looking at her. Michael. Alice whispered the name she read on the guy's name day. I'll come here again, Michael. Mother and daughter reached the house in silence, but when they got out of the car, away from the driver's ears, Diana seemed to realize, Oh, daughter, and we forgot to buy you accessories for your phone. Headphones. A case for your new smartphone. All right. I'll go back to the store tomorrow and get it for you. What color case do you want? Don't mom. Alice got angry. You don't have to go anywhere. I'll buy the cover myself. Will you stop fluffing up your old feathers in front of young boys? How are you talking to me? Diana shrieked. What do you mean, old feathers? Where do you see an old lady? Come on, mom. You're not 18 years old anymore. And you're still looking at young guys. It's only dad who doesn't notice anything. Of course, in front of him, you behave differently, and I'm already ashamed to bring my friends into the house. As soon as a less handsome guy walks in, you start parading around. You think I don't know where you go when your dad's at work, and how reverently you keep your phone close to you at all times. Stop talking nonsense, Diana shouted, and where do you stick your nose anyway? Are you trying to tell me what to do with the chicken's eggs? I don't want to hear any more talk like that. You won't if you don't go to today's store to wag your tail in front of the salesman. But if you continue to push him around, I'll tell daddy. Or I'll have him catch you in the act. I hate that you're lying to him, but I'm used to keeping quiet. I've been used to it since I was a kid. I don't think you deserve daddy. I just don't want to disturb his peace of mind. I don't want to worry him. Alice shook a little. The first time in her life, she allowed herself to talk to her mother like that, although she had long been seething with indignation seeing her mother's constant cheating. The girl did not listen to Diana's angry answer, but turned around and jumped out into the yard. She took out her cell phone and dialed her friend Alfia. She had recently turned 18 and her parents had given her a brand new car for her birthday. Alfia, hi, are you busy right now? Could you take me somewhere? An hour later, the girls were sitting in the car and looking carefully at the huge glass doors of the electronics store where Alice had recently bought her smartphone. It's still half an hour before the store closes. Alfia grumbled unhappily, looking at the time on the dashboard. What are we going to sit here for so long? Let's go in and look at your handsome boy. No, Alice was afraid. I've only been here recently. He'll know I'm on purpose. Of course he will. But isn't that what you want if you like him so much? How are you going to get to know him? Also, you forgot something. Is it okay that you're dating Oliver? You think he'd be so cool with you telling him you like someone else? Oliver's a complicated guy, and I don't think he'd tolerate that. Why do I have to think about Oliver right now? Who says I'm gonna make it with this guy? Maybe he has a girlfriend. Well, judging by your burning eyes, you'd move any girl, Alfia smirked. Half an hour later, the store employees began to disperse to their homes. In the crowd, Alice almost missed a tall guy who went out in the company of girls' employees of the store. There he is there, Alice shouted sharply, pointing her finger at the windshield. Start the car, Alfia. Let's go after him. Why are we going to chase him? My friend was surprised. Okay, as you say, it's not difficult for me. I can't see him now, of course, but by all appearances, the guy is in demand among the female sex. Look at all those girls chasing him. He walked with his colleagues only to the corner and then saying goodbye ran to the bus stop. The guy didn't notice the car following him. He was thinking about the girl customer he met in the store today. Her mom, of course, is a little strange, but they have the smell of wealth. The kind of smartphone they'd bought would take him several years to save up for. But for them, it must be nothing. Michael sighed. As much as he didn't like the girl, how could a simple salesman like her? Mom, are you home? I'm home. Michael shouted as he entered the apartment. Georgia, who had just returned from her shift, had already prepared a flavorful kerning for her son. My hand, son, she looked out of the kitchen. We'll have dinner now. Mmm, how delicious it smells, squeezed his eyes, sitting down at the table. When do you have time for everything? How many times have I told you, Mom? You are so tired. Come from work and rest. I am able to cook dinner myself. 
I don't mind. Georgia waved her hand. Come on, tell me how was your day? What's new? I met such a girl today. She bought a phone for me yesterday with her mom. And today she came back to get a case for it. We got to talking. You know, she's so, uh, she's cool, you know? I thought a girl like that would never pay attention to me. But she hinted that she'd like to meet me. Tomorrow's my day off and I'm gonna see her. And she has such an unusual name, Alice. I just don't know where I'm supposed to take her. She seems to be from a very wealthy family. And what can I offer her? A movie and a coffee shop? Georgia, who at the mention of the girl's name had an unpleasant prickling in her stomach, nevertheless paid no attention to it. I'll tell you what, son, if a girl really likes you, she'll be glad to go to a cafe with you. But I don't trust them, those rich ones. Why did they need simple laborers like us? And you should pick an easy girl, but that's up to you. Tell me, how are your studies going? When's the next session? Michael had finished 11 grades well and had a great desire to get a higher education, but Georgia could not afford it. They both realized that. Then the guy made an independent decision. Immediately after school, he got a job as a salesman, and after saving up some money, he enrolled in correspondence school. I will pay for my studies myself, he told his mother. I'll work and study by correspondence, it's no big deal. You're already out of your skin to provide for us. Enough already, we will last now. Give up the rate of nurse. Georgia stubbornly refused. The woman felt guilty. All their lives they'd been struggling to make ends meet and no savings and loan. If her son was going to go to college, he wouldn't have anything. She couldn't even pay for his education. The next day, Michael and Alice met in the city. The guy was a little embarrassed, leading the girl to the movies. What else could he offer this spoiled beauty? Alice didn't care. With this guy, she was ready to just walk around the city, holding hands. From one look of his expressive eyes, the girl's head was blown off. For the first time in her life, Alice fell in love like that without a second thought. It seemed that she was ready to follow Michael to the edge of Anna. Relationships were wrapped up rapidly. Alice immediately after school, studying in the 11th grade, through half the city was carried to a familiar store just to see Michael and interchange with him a few words. The first day, she went on a date with Michael. Alice gave her current boyfriend Oliver the rune around. Oliver was a 19-year-old major with a cool car and was totally unprepared for this turn of events. To be turned down? How could she? Usually girls chase after him and he dumps them after he's played with them. Oliver's wounded ego was at play. Alice's friend Althea was silent as a partisan and did not want to explain to him the reason for such a sharp break in relations. Then Oliver himself decided to track down his ex-girlfriend. It was not difficult at all. Oliver only had to drive up to the school and there she was Alice, rushing to the bus stop and driving in the opposite direction from her house. When Oliver realized the reason for the breakup was another guy, he was furious. How could Alice dump him for some salesman? The guy was a sucker and Oliver's sneakers alone were worth more than all the clothes on that salesman and probably more than all the things he had. Oliver couldn't let it go. Just as Alice had done, he waited until Michael's workday was over and when he came out of the store, he walked toward him. Hey, you, 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 let's go aside. We need to talk. Michael shrugged his shoulders and followed the major to this car. Oliver came to his car, leaned on it, and ostentatiously playing with the keys, looked threateningly into Michael's eyes. You know, Alice? Well, this is my girlfriend. After these words, Michael immediately realized who was in front of him. Alice was telling him about her ex-boyfriend, with whom she had dated not seriously, out of boredom and broke up immediately, barely meeting Michael. Ex-girlfriend, as far as I know, Michael smiled. You two broke up and now she's dating me. She's the one who thinks we broke up, but it's not up to her. I didn't break up with her. In fact, Alice is mad at me, so she's using you to make me jealous. When she cools off, we'll be fine. I don't think so, Michael countered. You don't get it. Oliver began to argue. If I ever see you around Alice again, I'll tear your legs off. Rip it out. Rip it out right now, what's stopping you? I'm telling you right now, I'm not giving up on Alice. You're a tough one, I see, Oliver shouted and looked at his opponent appraisingly. Yeah, he'd probably lose to this guy in a direct confrontation. 
Michael was taller and shoulders taller. And judging by his gait, he's no stranger to sports. Oliver's favorite places to hang out were hookah joints and clubs. I warned you, make your conclusions, Oliver said through gritted teeth, retreating to the driver's door. I'm a man of my word. If I see you with Alice again, you'll be sorry, very sorry. But that's if you live. Wow, what threats, Michael laughed. I also repeat, I will not give up Alice. These words the guy said after the departing car, in which sat Oliver, seething with anger. Oliver was used to the fact that everything in life was easy for him. Thanks to his father's money, and people, as a rule, always passed him up, seeing expensive clothes and a cool car. But those people are smart, Oliver thought. This one must be a fool. Fools are taught. Let him try not to listen to me. And it wasn't that Oliver needed Alice so much. He had plenty of girls like her, but his wounded ego called for action. After a couple days, Oliver was convinced that the salesman hadn't heeded his words and was still seeing Alice. Oliver sat in his car and watched them walk down the street holding hands. Anger boiled up inside. The guy already knew what he was going to do. Taking his gaze away from the couple annoying him, Oliver called one of his acquaintances. Leshy, hey, I've got a favor to ask you. You've got the contact info for these badass athletes. Yeah, yeah, they're the goon squad that do certain favors for money. Set me up with them. I got a good paying assignment for them. What do you care? I just need to teach a sucker a lesson. A good one. Oliver in his car was following Michael down a dark street. Michael had just seen Alice off to her house and had gone back on foot because the buses weren't running because of the late hour. He couldn't even call a cab. Oliver sneered, driving slowly. Oliver waited for Michael to enter the dark alley. In addition to the driver, there were four big, pumped up guys of gangster appearance in the car. These guys were providing some services for a fee. And Steve went about them as completely badasses. We won't follow him for long, one of the jocks muttered. There's a good spot over there. He's about to make a turn and stop. We'll book him there, but let's talk terms right away. How do we take the guy down? Like cold turkey? No, do the whole thing, Oliver shuddered. Just break his legs, that's all. Well, maybe he could spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair. Deal, said the jock, pulling his balaclava over his face. Keep in mind, if this guy points you out, forget about us. When they take you for one place, you better not even think about us. I can't be taken for this place, Oliver said pathetically. Do you know who my father is? We've heard, the jock muttered through gritted teeth. All right, clients turned stop. Michael walked home happy, thinking about Alice. How'd he like this girl? At first, he thought that Alice is a major, but she turned out to be not spoiled by money and easy to communicate. At least in front of Michael, the girl never boasted of wealth and gladly went with Michael to the movies, walked around the city, visited inexpensive caves. And although Michael clearly felt their social inequality, still in the depths of his soul, he had a hope that they could do something. After all, the young people did not want to part in the evenings. Michael was walking with a slight smile on his lips when out of the darkness a big guy with a bat in his hand stepped toward him. His face was not visible, as it turned out later, not only because of the darkness, he was wearing a balaclava. At first, Michael didn't even get excited thinking that he was mistaken for someone else. But then a man's voice sounded behind him, which seemed vaguely familiar. Well, we've met, just as I promised. Michael turned sharply to look at the man who was speaking. It was Alice's ex-boyfriend, who had threatened him a few days ago. Don't say I didn't warn you, Oliver grinned. I keep my word. Georgia was working the night shift, and it was business as usual, except that Michael wasn't returning her calls. That made the woman a little worried. Her son didn't call back after a while, as he always did. Georgia calmed herself with the thought that Michael must have fallen asleep after a long day at work. He still managed to go out with his new girlfriend after work. Georgia did not approve of the relationship. Having learned that the girl was from a wealthy family, the woman thought that such relationships could not lead to anything good, but let them sort it out themselves. Georgia was especially upset in the morning although the time was still early, but usually Michael had already gotten up for work. Not only had he never called back, but his phone was unavailable. The woman had barely waited until the end of her shift and was about to run home when she was called from her post. 
Georgia, can you drop off the case histories at the emergency room on the way? Yeah, sure, Georgia nodded, grabbing the papers. I'll do it, it's no problem. The woman went down in the elevator, and her heart clenched with a bad feeling. Already heading for the exit, she caught herself and rushed to the waiting room. There at that moment, they were carrying a patient from the ambulance on a stretcher. Imagine, a very young guy. They found him when it started to get light. We don't know how long he'd been lying there. He was beaten up, badly beaten. We need to get him to intensive care, the paramedic from the ambulance told the emergency room nurses. Georgia herself didn't know what made her, what force made her, approach the stretcher and look into the face of the beaten boy. Her heart stopped beating, her eyes were covered with a veil. The woman fainted, right in front of the stretcher. What's wrong with her? The paramedic was surprised. That's the nurse from surgery, right? Yeah, that's Georgia. She looked at the guy and collapsed right away. Must be someone she knows. What if it's? Oh my God, she told me she had a son that age. God forbid. Georgia came to her senses on the couch where the nurses had moved her. She remembered everything right away. The guy, the guy they brought in in the ambulance. He's in the ICU, Georgia. Do you know him? Georgia jumped up off the couch and rushed out of the emergency room. It must be her son. I'm not mistaken, the nurse muttered. What a grief. Even though Georgia was a nurse, they wouldn't let her in the emergency room, no matter how hard she tried. We're gonna do everything we can to help your son, and you don't need to see him right now, believe me. There's nothing you can do to help him now. Here, take his things for now. The doctor put a bag of clothes in one hand and Michael's cell phone in the other. Georgia accepted it and absently pressed the power button. The phone, beeping merrily, blinked with a lighted screen. The screensaver showed his face pressed against the girl's cheek. There she is, his Alice, Georgia thought. Wow, how much did my son talk about her and he never bothered to show a picture. Then numerous social media messages from this Alice girl Zamordianized on the screen. Michael, where are you? Where are you? Why aren't you answering? Georgia clicked on one of these messages and found herself on the girl's page. What an interesting status she had. My favorite is the best in the world. Did she write that about Michael? Swallowing back tears, Georgia thought. Maybe this girl actually loves him. I'll have to tell her what happened, but later, when my son comes to the senses, and Michael must, must come to the senses, Otherwise, there's no reason for me to go on living. My son is the only thing that makes sense in my life. I've already lost my beloved husband once, but then there was Michael and there was something to live for. The girl Alice apparently saw that Michael was online and sent a bunch of new messages urging him to answer her. Georgia flipped down the screen. Alice's pictures flashed up. There she was at home. Yes, this girl is not a poor girl. Yeah, and here she was, apparently with her parents. Georgia fixed her eyes on the face of Alice's mother. The phone fell out of her hands. The woman slowly slid down the wall, passing out for the second time that day. Diana and her husband were having dinner. It was one of those rare evenings when John came home early and Diane herself had no plans. The couple ate in silence. It had been a long time since they'd had a common topic of conversation. Diana didn't want to know how her husband was doing at work, and he wasn't interested in how his wife spent her time. Their only common topic was their daughter. After a long silence, John asked Michael a question. Where are we with Alice? I don't see her that much lately. Where is she? How should I know? The wife shrugged her shoulders. She doesn't report to me. Probably out with her boyfriend. What boyfriend, Oliver? You're out of touch with life, Diana snorted. Our daughter broke up with Oliver. She's got another friend of her heart now. She hasn't brought him home, and something's gone wrong there, judging by how nervous Alice has been the last few days. How is it, Diane? You stay at home and you don't talk to your daughter at all. No matter where you ask, you never know where she is. I realize she's a big girl, but not so big that you can't control her. Does she let herself be controlled? Diana exclaimed indignantly. Tonka is like a prickly hedgehog, snapping at you when you ask her anything. She only snaps at you. And that's what I don't understand, because you're her mother. You're supposed to be close, but you're the opposite. John did not have time to finish. 
As a disheveled Alice burst into the dining room and began to shout at her mother. Mom, what happened on the river 15 years ago? Tell me now. Alice, are you out of your mind? John frowned. Why do you let yourself yell at your mother? And what's the matter with you anyway? What's that look? Did you get into a fight with someone? John noticed a bright red scratch on his daughter's cheek. I wasn't in a fight, Dad. A complete stranger tried to beat me up. Alice plopped down on a chair and grabbed a glass of water from the table and began to drink greedily. Frowning John looked at his daughter and waited for her to get drunk and explain to him what was going on. I'll tell you everything first, Dad, said the girl seeing her father's tense look. I'm seeing a guy right now. His name is Michael. He's nice, very nice. He's a part-time graduate student and he's working so he can help his mother. She raised him alone. Michael always spoke only warmly of his mother. I love Michael, Dad, I really do. It's not just a childhood crush anymore. Three days ago, he disappeared, stopped contacting me. I couldn't breathe at the thought that he might have left me. I really couldn't breathe without him. Every day I went to the store where he works, but the employees didn't know anything. Michael just disappeared, never showed up for work. And just today, one of the clerks found out what really happened to Michael. He was beaten up on the street and he's still in intensive care. I found out what hospital he was in and I ran straight there. And his mom was there. Dad, you have no idea what happened. She attacked me in the hospital hallway. At first, I thought the woman was crazy. She wanted to scratch my eyes out. I couldn't understand how a person who didn't know me could lash out at me with such hatred. But she didn't do it silently, she screamed. Screaming that I was the curse of her life, that 15 years ago she lost her beloved husband, his father, because of me. And now Michael had been beaten up, again because of me. When the nurses pulled this woman away from me, I started screaming too. I yelled at her, you're crazy, I've never met you before. Why do you think Michael was beaten because of me? And what does your husband have to do with it? Ask your mother, let her tell you how 15 years ago my husband gave his life for someone else's child on the river, for you. Your mother was too drunk and partying to watch her own daughter. Michael's mom told me to get out of the hospital and never dare go near her son again. And I love Michael and I'm not going to listen to her. I don't know how badly he was beaten, but if he dies, I die with him. Now I ask you, mom, so what happened on that river 15 years ago and why does that woman hate me so much? Diana sat there, neither dead nor alive. She straightened in her chair like a taut string and the woman's eyes darted from her husband to her daughter. Diana realized what she had feared for so long had happened, and then she relaxed. Time had passed, all was forgotten. That's what Diana thought. And it turned out that's how the truth came out. The woman rolled with a nervous laugh. I don't know what you're talking about, Alice. This is really crazy. I don't think so, said a pale John. For some reason, I remembered the story on the river very well. A man drowned there, saving someone else's child. Why do I remember it? Because at the time, I thought a lot about that man's selflessness. I even gave his widow money as financial aid through other people. But what makes her think it's you, Alice? She's deluded. Maybe you look like that girl. Maybe someone put it in her head. Okay, John got up from the table abruptly. Now you and I are going to go with her and we're going to get to the bottom of this. Yes, yes, let's go, Daddy, Alice nodded often. Tell that crazy woman that she is wrong, and I want to see Michael. I want to know what's wrong with him. You don't have to go anywhere, Diana shrieked. You've already realized that this woman is not in her right mind. Apparently, she's a disturbed woman. Diana faltered at the suspiciously angry look her husband gave her, and realized that the seed of doubt had already been planted in him. Georgia was sitting on the couch in the nurse's lounge, drinking valerian. Georgia, what are you doing? A nurse she knew said with horror. Why are you so hard on that girl? I thought you were going to tear her hair out. Is this really the girl who drowned your Steve? Well, even if it was, it wasn't the girl's fault. Guilty as charged, exhaled Georgia, who had become a little sluggish under the sedatives. My son was beaten up because of that girl. I lost my husband because of her. I hate her and her mother. I hate them so much. Why, why did they come into our lives and become a curse on our family? An orderly came barreling into the nurse's room and looked at Georgia warily and said, Georgia, 
There's this. A man's here with the girl you've been roughing up. Apparently, it's her father, and he insists on talking to you. They weren't allowed into the station, of course. They're waiting for you downstairs in the visiting room. Let me tell them you're sick and can't come out. This guy's very solid. Probably wants to confront you for beating up his daughter. What? You think I'm afraid of them? Georgia jumped up. After what's happened to me in this life, I'm not afraid of anything or anyone. The worst has already happened. But Michael is still alive, said the nurse timidly. Yes, my son is alive. And to keep him alive, I must keep him away from this family. Georgia jumped up from the couch and ran past the nurse and the frightened nurse. Don't let anything happen again, the nurse muttered. What if there's a fight? Georgia's probably not in her right mind. I've been working with Georgia for years, and I'll never forget what happened to her when her husband drowned. Then she was all about Michael, living for her son, and here she is again. And it's all because of this family. It's like a fate, really. Jonah and Alice. Georgia came down, seemingly calm. They had no way of knowing it was the sedatives they'd given her in the nurse's station. The drugs had given Georgia a certain lethargy, but her gaze still flashed with rage when she saw Alice sitting on a bench next to a stout man. John intercepted that look and jumped up from his seat, blocking his daughter. Your name is Georgia and you beat my daughter. I'm not going to return the favor. I think you were acting in a state of shock. I take it this is all about a story from 15 years ago on the river. Only tell me, what makes you think Alice is the girl who drowned? You're deluded. Am I mistaken? Laughed Georgia bitterly. Do you really think that I saw a resemblance to that child in Alice and threw myself at her because of that? I didn't. I just recognized who her mother was. You're dying I'll remember for the rest of my life. What are you doing here, messing with me? You can't be ignorant of that story. I heard of that story and I admire your husband, but I never imagined it would happen to my girl. If you're right, my wife hid everything from me. Tell me exactly what happened. What happened? Your dying got drunk with a friend and two guys and didn't watch your daughter. The girl fell off a cliff. Steve and I were on our way home when panic set in. My husband jumped in after your baby. He knew. He knew about the vortex, and he warned me repeatedly not to go near it. Steve knowingly sacrificed himself for a chance to save someone else's daughter. Then I came to your house to ask for money for the funeral, alone, but your wife treated me like a beggar reprimanded me and said that no one asked my husband to jump. It was his own fault. She couldn't have said that. John shrieked. Diana is far from perfect, but she's not that cynical. I see you don't know who you're living with, and you don't know what goes on in your own home. How can you not know that your child almost drowned? You're a bad family. You're a rotten family. Steve and I had a real one. We loved each other, and after he died, life became a struggle to survive. Your daughter's living the good life. She's a beautiful, spoiled brat. But my son is in intensive care because of her. I don't know if he's going to make it. What do you mean you don't know? Michael could die. Alice cried from behind her father's back. And why me? Why are you blaming me for everything? Because your ex-boyfriend beat up Michael with the help of some thugs. His name is Oliver. Michael regained consciousness and told the coroner everything. Oliver? Oliver did it? Are you sure? John was surprised. I know his father well. A lot of people know his father, believe me. And the investigator's eyes glazed over when he heard that name. It's already clear that Oliver won't be held accountable for anything. He will. John said imperiously, looking intently into George's eyes. If he's guilty, he will, I give you my word. His father is a powerful man, of course, but I'm not the last man in this town. I'll do my best, but Oliver will be held accountable, and someone else will, and we'll see you again. John said the last words as he walked toward the door, dragging his daughter by the hand. Alice was crying. Why, why did you say that Michael might not survive? She looked back at Georgia. That was all the girl cared about at that moment. Diana sat in the living room, all tense and ready for the upcoming conversation. It seemed to her that she was ready. Well, after all, it had been so many years. She was young and foolish. John must discount that. As her husband whirled into the house and opened his mouth, ready to unleash the full force of his anger on his wife's head, she prevented him from doing so by speaking first. 
I get it, you found out. You are aware that it was Alice, that she was the one who drowned in the river, so. Yes, I made a mistake going to the river, but that was a long time ago. I would have told you back then. But do you remember how you acted? How do you blame that negligent mother you said you had, not knowing it was me? And I was right. John roared, I still think so. Neglectful, you put it mildly. I think much worse of you. You've never been a normal mother. And I've put up with you all my life for my daughter's sake. And now it turns out our daughter might not be alive if it weren't for a stranger, and all because of you. What are you talking about? Diane is boiling. He tolerates me, and I don't? Or do you think life with you is easy? You're never home. How many times have we been away together? I can count on my fingers. You think that's life? Well, as far as I'm concerned, you're living life to the fullest. Or do you really think I don't know about your young lovers? I just didn't care. I don't care about you, Diane. About you or how you spend your time. As long as you don't bother me. I didn't divorce you so I wouldn't traumatize my daughter. Then there's that damn disease, your infertility. I'd be a bastard to divorce you, leaving a sick wife. So I put up with it. I haven't felt anything for you for a long time, and I don't care if you're going out. But now that I know you almost killed a child, lying to me and shitting on the soul of Steve's widow who turned to you. You're such an asshole, Diane. I don't want to see you another day. You realize this is the end of our married life together. Diane was furious, realizing that nothing could be done now and John would divorce her anyway. She wanted to hurt him too. So be it. Go ahead and divorce him. I'll tell you what, you're not only a horny deer, you're a dumbass. You say you live with me because I'm infertile. I'm not infertile. I didn't want to have a baby. I didn't want to nurse those little smotty babies. And I didn't care that you wanted a son. So you had to settle for just a daughter. John squinted angrily at his wife and unexpectedly for her laughed. Do you think you've trampled me now? Don't get your hopes up. Yes, I felt sorry for you and believed you. So I did not leave you. But I wasn't gonna give up my kids because of you. I've got a second family with two kids growing up. The oldest is 10 years old. And now I won't even wait for an official divorce from you. I'll bring them here as soon as you leave the house. And you'll be out of the house fast. And I'll talk to Alice. I don't think she'll want to go with you. You're such a bad mother. Your daughter will never support you. Diane was trying to play nice and get a divorce. I've been wanting to do that for a long time. I won't be alone either. And in the divorce, I'll take half of everything you own. It's not gonna work, Diane. You're gonna walk away with your ass naked. You think because you've been cheating on me for so long, I haven't taken care of it. You sign the papers without realizing it and you get nothing in the divorce. That can't be. Diana shrieked, you bastard. I didn't sign anything. And if you did, I'll hire a lawyer to prove that you did it all by deception. What are you gonna hire a lawyer for, Diane? It takes good money to hire a good lawyer. Now who has more money, you or me? You know, when I slicked you those papers to sign, I wasn't really planning on using them, just in case. And now I realize you're being punished. It's a little punishment for being such a scumbag. Oliver was rocking out in the club to the rhythmic sounds of loud music when two men in civilian clothes approached him, quickly waving a crust in front of the guy's face. One of them threw. You're under arrest. Oliver was a little stoned, and he found himself laughing eerily. I'm in custody. Do you even know who you're talking to? Do you know who my father is? We know, we know, muttered one of the cops, roughly pushing Mitri into the duty car. We know everything, all questions to the superiors. It was necessary to see the confusion on Oliver's face when he realized that what was happening was not a joke, not a prank of friends, and he was really being taken to the station, knowing who his father was. The next morning, a confused secretary came into John's office. John, there's a man here to see you. I told him you were busy. Get out of the way, rudely pushed the girl away, a full balding man in an expensive suit, bursting into the office. Hello, John. I'll get right to the point. My son was arrested yesterday. Can you believe it? Oliver was arrested right in the club. I know, John replied, making no attempt to stand up and offered his hand to his old acquaintance. You know, don't you? The man frowned. And I thought it wasn't true when I was told that this arrest had its roots in you. It's true, Archie. Your son brutalized a guy and he's gonna be held accountable for it. Who said that? 
The big man got all worked up. Who's the boy? It was just a fight over a girl. Your daughter, by the way. But that guy's nobody and his name's nobody. I don't get it, John. Do you have a personal grudge against me? No, it's nothing personal. It's just that the guy's not a stranger to me. Consider it that. Who is he to you? Archie's confused. Is he so close to you that you're going to fight with me over him? Very close. I'm ready to fight if I have to. John got up from the table. You know, it's just that whoever has the most money is right. In this case, you lose. I'm not doing anything illegal, and your son will be held fully accountable for what he did. And he's going down. You want to fight me, Archie? Believe me, I'll go all the way. Sweat beaded on the big man's bald head. He'd known John for years and knew that when he said he'd go all the way, he'd go all the way. Archie knew the man's stubbornness firsthand, and Archie knew John's capabilities too. John, come on really, we've known each other for years too. What's he gonna do, go to jail? It's not that big a deal. Maybe he'll get off on probation. He won't, John said meaningfully. It'll be what the court says it will be. By the law at this time, Oliver's not your only son, is he? What would it be like for the other two if dad went bankrupt? Even so, Archie squinted at him. Even so, John cut him off. At the same time in the hospital, under the door of the intensive care unit, Georgia was sobbing. The doctor had recently told her the terrible news. Michael's kidneys were failing. He needs a transplant. Of course, he will be put on a waiting list for a donor organ. But Georgia has worked in medicine for too long and knew perfectly well what the chance of waiting for that waiting list is. Mine, take mine, Georgia shouted without hesitation. The doctor nodded, as if knowing her mother's reaction in advance. Yes, it is possible in principle. Let's go through the necessary examination, and we will make sure that your organ is suitable for transplantation. And so, a few minutes ago, the doctor said that her kidney is not suitable. As she wept, Georgia tried to pull herself together, stop crying, and find a solution. Something had to be done. Michael could go on for hours. She of all people should know that. The woman straightened up wiped her tear-stained eyes and only then saw Alice peeking out from around the corner leading to the emergency room. Brave fool, thought the woman. Have you come again? Did I not clearly tell you not to show your face here anymore? Kill me. Alice took a step out of the corner. Kill me. Pull out all my hair. I'll still come here. I've been standing here a long time and I heard you talking to the doctor. Michael needs a kidney transplant and yours isn't a match. Take mine. I'm ready. Georgia looked carefully at the excited, covered with red spots girl. Dummy, do you realize what you're proposing? It's not an easy surgery. Anything can happen when you take a donor organ, you could die. But even if everything goes well, you'll only have one kidney and that's not a full life. Do you realize that? I'm not as stupid as you think I am. I understand the risks. Even if I die, I'm okay with it. No, that's not the right word. I don't agree, I insist. I would rip a kidney out of myself just to keep Michael alive. When I think he might be gone, I don't want to live. Georgia looked at Alice thoughtfully, as if seeing her for the first time. You stupid girl, you don't understand anything yet. You're a minor and you don't have the right to decide such things. Maybe, I admit, you really love my son, but I can't do anything about my dislike for you. Alice flew out of the hospital like scalded and threw herself on the roadway, blocking the way of a yellow car with a checkered flag. The cab driver braked sharply, almost touching the girl standing on the road with his bumper. He jumped out and attacked her, almost with fists. What are you doing, you crazy girl? You're sick of living. Go throw yourself off the bridge. What do I have to do with it? Alice didn't listen to him. She ran to the passenger door, opened it and got into the car. I need you to take me downtown now. I'm not getting out of the car. Take me. I have to go to my father's office. The cab driver was already eyeing the unstable passenger with apprehension. Either she was crazy or this girl had something happen and it was serious. The man silently got behind the wheel and turned the car around. John's secretary had only recently come to her senses after a visit from a man who had roughly pushed her and then Alice burst in and raced to the door of her father's office. Your daddy doesn't have time. He has a meeting. The secretary shouted at her back. 
Alice flew into the office and not paying attention to several respectable men sitting at a long table shouted, Daddy, you have to authorize me to donate a kidney to Michael. Well, John said angrily, I didn't raise you well, daughter. Don't you notice anything around you? You don't see people sitting around and you barge in. Go out to the waiting room and wait there. No, Dad, this case can't wait. Michael could die. Okay, got it, Dad sighed heavily. He turned to his staff. Would you mind leaving us? The meeting is adjourned. Sorry, family matters. The men rose at the same time and looking disapprovingly at the chief's ill-mannered daughter, left the office. I'm listening to you carefully, Alice. What happened there? I was at the hospital. Michael's kidneys are failing. He needs an emergency transplant. His mom's kidney isn't a match. He has to wait in line and he might not get it, you know? I'm young, I'm healthy. I can easily live with one kidney. But I'm a minor, you have to sign the authorization. That's out of the question. John cut him off. Alice screamed. She screamed and screamed, not noticing that her father was sitting with his hand on his head, not paying any attention to his daughter, thinking carefully about something. Shut up, Alice, he finally said, raising his head at Alice. I already told you, you won't be Michael's donor, I will be. If my kidney is a match, of course, but somehow I think it will. It has to be. Michael's father gave his life for you, and I'm only giving a kidney for his son's life. Diane stalked her daughter outside the school. It's not the first time a woman's done that. And it wasn't because she missed Alice. She needed the money. Of course, Diana left her husband's house not completely empty-handed, and she had money and jewelry in sufficient quantity. But she had moved in with a young and voracious lover. Voracious not in terms of food, but in terms of needs. Having got in touch with Diana, the guy was used to living large and was not going to moderate his appetites. Moreover, now Diana lives on his territory, although he did not ask her to do so. Diana's money ran out lightning fast and the young friend began to hint that he was not going to provide for a grown-up aunt, and they had no obligations, they met only for pleasure. Diana felt humiliated, but she had nowhere to go, so she turned to her daughter for the first time. Alice, quite predictably, decided to stay with her father. Alice had money, her father was never stingy when it came to his favorite daughter, and she had given it to her mother several times, but the money was running out fast. Alice, hello, Diana waved her hand from the ajar window of the car, John had generously allowed her to take. I missed you, come on, get in the car. Alice sighed sadly and separated from the flock of girlfriends, with whom she came down from the school porch. The girl walked towards her mother's car. I don't have any money, was the first phrase of the girl when she sat down next to Diana. What, no money right away? Her mother pouted. Can't I just visit my daughter? I said I missed her. Don't lie to me, mom. You never missed me. In fact, you didn't need me. I realize that now. You came for money and I don't have any. Why not? Diane raised her eyebrows. What did your daddy turn his attention to his new kids? And you don't get anything from him. That's not the point, mom. Whether I get money from my father or not is none of your business. I don't have any more money for you. I know you didn't leave home empty handed and I know who you've blown it on. Don't come to see me again. Look, what arrogance. Diana curled her lips and this is my daughter talking to me. Your father too, such a hero, gave his kidney to some guy. The whole town's talking about it. It's all over the social media. Obviously, it's a PR stunt. After that, he's probably making a lot of money, but that he kicked his wife out of the house and brought in a second family, the story doesn't tell. How do you like living with your new family? How do you like your brothers? They're normal brothers, Alice said, and their mom is normal, even though she looks like a model, but she's homely, running around, looking at daddy's mouth. Maybe he originally needed such a one, Maybe your marriage was a mistake, and maybe I shouldn't have been born. Then Michael would have a father, and I'm nothing but trouble. If Diana had been an attentive mother, she would have noticed that her daughter was depressed, but she didn't care about Alice. She was frantically thinking about how to go on living, and on what? Without money, her lover would obviously kick her out, he had made that clear. Alice didn't care about her mother's worries either. With a loud slam of the car door, she jumped out and ran to catch up with her friends. She didn't want to go home. It was true that her father had a new family, and not that Alice had anything against them, 
she understood everything because she was a grown-up girl, but it just became unusual in the house. Alice felt superfluous and maybe not even in the house, maybe in this life. And everything seemed to be fine. Not so long ago, Alice was so happy when the kidney transplant operation on Michael was successful and it became clear that the guy will live. John, who had donated his organ, was also feeling fine. He had already been discharged from the hospital. And with Michael, everything was more complicated. He was still lying, but as the doctor said, was on the mend. And Alice found out through her father. Georgia did not let Alice near her son and forbade the girl to go near the hospital. I am grateful to your father, but together with Michael, you cannot be, said Georgia. You bring only unhappiness. And Alice believed in these words. The girl actually began to feel that way. She sank into a severe depression. She didn't want to do anything at all, neither to go home, nor to go out with her friends. Why nothing though? She wanted to be with Michael, but that was impossible. John was working in his office. Doctors, after discharge, strongly advised bed rest, but the man felt normal for a long time. He tried not to go to the office yet. He did things from home. The man did what he promised Diane he would do. Right after he kicked her out of the house, he brought his second family here, having talked to Alice beforehand. The boys were happy, and Kendall, their mom, was blowing John away. She never entered his office without knocking, afraid to disturb him while he was working. So now, there was a scraping at the massive door, and Kendall's head appeared. John, Alice's friend is here to see you. She wants to talk to you. Would you like to come out to the living room? Or should I bring her in here? Send her in here. There's probably boys walking around on their heads in the living room. That's just the way it is, Kendall smiled. A couple minutes later, Alice's close friend, Alfia, entered Joma's office. Hello, she said with embarrassment. Alice doesn't know about my visit to you, and you don't tell her or she'll be offended. I'm worried about her. What's wrong, Alfia? I can see Alice is sad, but it's because of Michael. His mom won't let them see each other anymore. Alice will get sad and forget him. Sad. Forgetful? Exclaimed Alfia. I wouldn't call it that. Do you know that your daughter climbs to the roof of an unfinished high-rise and stares down for hours? What do you think she's thinking at that moment? I'm really scared for Alice. She's got it in her head that she's bringing misfortune to others. And she doesn't want to live without Michael. At first, I thought it was just a crush and she'd forget him, but you know, it's not. Alice loves this guy, really loves him. We have to do something. I'm afraid for Alice. After the girl said that, John was worried. He didn't realize his daughter's feelings for Michael were so serious. Georgia took her son's things out of the hospital bedside table and put them neatly into bags. Finally, we're coming home with you, son. I made you some pies with cabbage, just the way you like them the woman chattered on. Michael was gloomy and his mother knew why, Alice. From the very beginning, as soon as the boy came to the senses, Georgia had told him she wouldn't let him date Alice and told him why. You want me dead, go ahead. He's seen this girl, step over your mother. These were the words with which the woman ended her speech. She was not affected even by the fact that John donated his kidney to Michael and the fact that the man opened a large money account in the name of her son. The money, by the way, the woman refused for a long time and was about to give it back to John. That's when their first serious conversation happened. This is a small part of what I have to do for you. Steve gave his life, and I just gave a kidney. Of course, money won't bring your husband and father back to you, but Georgia, think about it. Wouldn't Steve have made that money if you were alive? And whose fault is he not? That's just it. I want Michael to get a college degree full time and not work like he does now. And you, stop scrubbing floors in your hospital. It's time for a vacation. Michael will graduate and if he has the brains, start his own business. He'll have some startup capital. Let me do at least that for you. Georgia thought, thought long and hard. Then she got it out. Okay, we'll take the money. Let Michael have a chance at a normal future. Not like mine but you know I'm not gonna let him see Alice anyway. That's your right, John shrugged, taking youthful relationships lightly. Georgia and her son walked out of the hospital gates and Michael breathed in the fresh air he had missed in the hospital room. At that time, a huge SUV pulled up beside them. 
John jumped out of the car and grabbed the bags from George's hands. Get in the car and I'll give you a ride, he said. We'll take the bus, Georgia stubbornly argued. The man, not listening to the objections, literally pushed them into his car. A little way from the hospital, he turned into the first parking lot he could find. He turned off the engine and half turned around to look at Michael in the back seat. So, Michael, how do you feel about my daughter? I love her, he answered without a second thought. I see, John stretched out. Then why did you put up with your mom's ban? Michael hesitated. Then, lowering his eyes, mumbled. I didn't. What? Georgia shrieked from the front seat. She, too, turned to look at her son. What do you mean you haven't gotten over it? Michael, what are you talking about? Mom, look, all I can think about all the time is Alice. I understand, and I don't want to upset you, but I can't stop thinking about her. I was going to see Alice, to talk to her. If she's okay with our breakup, then well. She hasn't, John shouted. She's very much not okay with it, so much so that she's thinking of jumping off the roof. And I got that from a friend of hers. Georgia, you're a reasonable adult. What are you doing? Let the young people decide their own fate. They're not to blame for our sins. The more we interfere with them now, the more they'll be drawn to each other. They'll run away if it's not their destiny, but we shouldn't decide that for them. If my daughter jumps off the roof, what then? Your Steve will have died for nothing giving his life for her. Georgia, wake up. Georgia was almost crying. Why are you making a monster out of me? I reconsidered my attitude toward Alice when she wanted to give her kidney, but I'm afraid I have a crazy fear. Michael put his hand on his mother's shoulder and smiled. Don't be afraid, Ma. Everything is definitely going to be okay now. All the skeletons are out of the closets and only happiness lies ahead. A week later, Two young people came to the cemetery, a guy and a girl. The girl had a huge bouquet of scarlet roses in her hands. Here he is, my dad, said the guy, stopping near one of the graves. A young man with an open, friendly face looked at the girl from the monument. Thank you, whispered Alice, placing the flowers on the grave. Thank you for my life and for Michael. Jennifer loved this time of year. She could run quietly along the park's paths, breathing in the fresh scent of grass and flowering trees, still warm from the summer heat. And if you go out very early in the morning at six o'clock when the sun is just rising, then the pleasant coolness will help to make your morning jog more intense. Besides, not many people like to get up early and Jennifer liked that. She didn't even take her headphones with her on her jog. She listened to the rustling of the trees and the singing of waking birds. Sometimes squirrels ran, and mice rustled in last year's leaves. The girl could stop and watch the animals. Toward the middle of her training, dog owners came out for a walk with their pets. Some of them Jennifer recognized, as she had met them time and time again. They nodded their greetings and silently went their separate ways. She had started running in high school with a friend. Sandy had decided in her senior year of high school to lose weight for graduation. She was bored with running alone, so she called Jennifer. Jennifer didn't need to lose weight, she was already slim and agile. But how could she not help her friend? But then Sandy got sick, then she stayed up late, then she had important things to do in the morning. In general, there were many excuses, and Sandy's desire to go jogging in the mornings waned. Jennifer, on the other hand, got into it. She felt good after the run. And over time, those five to seven kilometers became a habit. Therefore, even when she moved to another city, she was very happy to find a large park with cozy benches and forest paths near her rented apartment. This morning she ran at an easy pace, as she had missed the previous two runs, and didn't want to overload her body before a hard day's work. Through her musings, she heard a rather heavy stomping behind her. I finally caught up with you, said the young man with a puff of breath. How fast you run. No, I'm in no hurry, replied Jennifer. I don't know. I could hardly get close to you. Maybe you're out of shape today. Maybe Jennifer suggested. I've been out of shape every day lately. Oh, I'm sorry, the man said. My name is Mike. Jennifer. Nice to meet you. I've noticed you running around here in the mornings for a long time. Only usually you're back by the time I get out. 
Well, today we were lucky enough to get out together. Where are you going? They were approaching a fork in the road toward a new street. Oh, great. Mind if I come with you? Of course not. If it's easier for you, it's much harder for me. But it's time to get back in shape. As they ran up the road together, Jennifer stopped and turned off the tracker. I'm done. Then I'm done, too. Can I go jogging with you again tomorrow? Please, 6.30. On this bench here, I'll stretch a little bit first, and then I'll run. Just please don't be late. I'm on the clock. No way. The next morning, when Jennifer arrived at the park, Mike was already waiting for her at the agreed place. They started their warm-up together. How long have you been running? Mike asked. More than five years. I started in high school. And you? I've been running since I was about 10. Then, however, after high school, I gave it up. But this year, I decided to start again. And you know why? Why? I just saw how you run here every morning with a smile, and frankly speaking, I envied you myself. I've been in a bad mood every morning lately. I thought maybe starting it off with a jog might help. Of course it would. It's the only thing that makes me feel better. Just positive vibes. After warming up, Jennifer ran her usual route again. She tried not to run very fast, but to keep a steady pace so that the young man wouldn't fall behind very much. Mike tried his best to keep up with the girl, but by the sixth kilometer he was finally exhausted. Do you mind if I quit today? Of course not. You can run your own route at your own pace. I'd love to do it with you. I just don't have that kind of training yet. Tomorrow, same place, same time. Yeah, see you then. And Jennifer ran easily ahead. Mike really waited for the girl at the appointed place every day. He ran with her more and more. Gradually, they were getting into the suggested pace. After a couple of weeks, Jennifer already stopped restraining her speed, and the young man kept up with her. You're getting in shape fast, aren't you? She praised Mike after the next session. Thanks to you, my beautiful sparring partner. Can I walk you home today? Aren't you in a hurry to get to work? Not today. I'm on vacation. Wow. Why don't you get some sleep or go somewhere else? I have a lot to do here, but I can spend more time jogging every morning. Well, that's great. Soon you'll be leaving me behind. Why would I want to leave such pleasant company? Now Mike walked Jennifer to the front door every time. It was about 10 minutes from the park to her house, and during that time they chatted about the weather, their activities, and life. That's how Jennifer learned that Mike works as a financial analyst and lives on the other side of the park. He has a car, which he sometimes uses to drive out of town to his dacha, where his parents live year-round. The more the girl talked to him, the more he charmed her with his knowledge, competent speech, friendliness, and the man himself turned out to be handsome. Just don't fall in love, she said to herself as she recalled her morning jogs during the day. You don't want that to happen now. But the more often she repeated this mantra to herself, the harder it was for her not to remember her morning companion. On their day off, after another workout, they walked up to the driveway. I can buy you a delicious morning coffee, Jennifer offered her companion. And at that moment she thought with horror, why am I saying this? I wish he'd say no, and she was greatly relieved when Mike agreed with pleasure. They went into the apartment. Jennifer invited her guest into the kitchen and put the coffee maker on. Do you mind? I'm going to take a shower for now, she asked. No, of course I feel at home, Mike laughed. The girl giggled and went into the bathroom. The next time they went jogging, they got caught in a heavy rain. And after they went up to Jennifer's house, she suggested that the man go into the bathroom to wash his feet, which were covered in mud. Could I stay? He asked. You don't worry. I'll be quick. Sure, Jennifer gave him a towel. Drinking coffee on weekends after a run had become their tradition. They took turns in the shower, too, until one day they bumped into each other in the doorway, and the girl felt the urge to snuggle up to the man. Mike put his arm around her lightly and began kissing her, at first gently and then realizing that the girl did not resist more and more insistently and passionately. It was then, after their first intimacy, that Jennifer learned that Mike was married. I probably shouldn't have done that, he murmured, cuddling the girl in bed. You didn't like it? 
She was upset. No, it felt really good. You know, how can I put it? Well, it turns out I cheated on my wife. So you're married? She jumped up on the bed. Why didn't you tell me before? Well, somehow I didn't have to. As it is about my parents at the dacha told me about the car too. And about my wife, I didn't have a chance. Do you have kids? Yes, two daughters. So pack up and get out of here. And don't let me see you around me again. But why? I'm so sorry I didn't warn you. I didn't think it would go this far. And then I couldn't stop. You're so beautiful. Is that why you decided to deceive me? I didn't decide anything. Jennifer was sitting in the kitchen, staring off into the distance. How did this happen? She thought. Why didn't I ask him right away? Why did I let it come to this? Then she remembered how attracted she had been to Mike and felt even more remorseful. When Jennifer was a little girl, her father, who called her the most wonderful daughter in the world, suddenly left her mother for another woman. Jennifer then did not understand the complex parental relationships, but fiercely hated her father's new girlfriend. As a teenager, she firmly decided for herself that she would not have affairs with married men. She didn't want other children to experience what she had when her father left. And now she found herself in the position of a mistress herself. Jennifer decided not to cross paths with Mike anymore and began to figure out how she could change the time or route of her runs. The next day, she didn't see anyone. And then she didn't either. On the one hand, the girl was glad that she was no longer tempted. But on the other hand, she resented the fact that she was so easily forgotten after the first time. No more meetings or phone calls. On Saturday, she went into the entrance and suddenly found Mike at the door of his apartment in his usual clothes with a large bouquet in his hands. He rushed over to the girl. I'm so sorry, please. I didn't know this would happen. I realized I really want to be with you. Don't chase me away and listen to me. Jennifer stopped at the stairs, but realized that there was no way she was going to get into the apartment unless she talked to Mike. Why are you here? I wanted to apologize. These are for you, he held out the flowers. You're the best, and I feel really bad without you. Thank you, Jennifer answered dryly, but her heart was jumping with joy. Let me through. She walked over and opened the door. May I wash my hands? The man asked modestly. I got them dirty while I was waiting for you. The girl shrugged her shoulders. Come in. Mike went into the bathroom. Jennifer started looking for a vase, which she didn't remember where she had put away since she hadn't received flowers as a gift in a long time. As she bent down to look for the vase in the nightstand, Mike came up behind her and put his arm around her. Let go, she tried to pull away. He squeezed her even tighter. I'm sorry, I can't do this without you. The girl resisted, but at some point she suddenly realized that she too wanted everything to happen again. She turned and kissed the man. All principles went to waste. Mike rarely showed up for a run now, but he was always waiting for her outside her driveway or apartment. They would go in, tear each other's clothes off with fury, and make love to exhaustion. Then reluctantly they would pull away from each other, and the man would leave. And Jennifer went about her daily business. Every workday she looked forward to the weekend and a new date. You convinced yourself not to fall in love. And not only did you completely dissolve into this man, but you broke your own rules. He's married and his daughters. And you are just a mistress with whom he is resting from family boredom, the girl thought. She was about to come to terms with her situation when she suddenly discovered that she was pregnant. This was not part of her plans at all. Her salary was barely enough for a rented apartment in life. And then there was a baby. The girl decided to have an abortion. Only there was a problem the procedure was done for a fee, and Jennifer did not have the means. So she decided to tell Mike about the pregnancy he is also involved in her situation. When the man came to her once again, after intimacy, she said, I'm pregnant. What he asked her again, I feel so good with you that I got pregnant. I have to have an abortion, but I don't have the money. Will you help pay for it? What abortion? Mike exclaimed, it's beautiful. I love you and the baby so much. Give me a son, please. I only have two daughters. May you and I have a son. Mike looked at the girl pleadingly. She was very surprised at his reaction, which she had not expected from a married man. Jennifer assumed that there would be a scandal, threats, the breakup of the relationship. But the joy of it completely threw her off balance. 
But how, Mike? You're married, aren't you? What kind of son would I have? How am I supposed to raise him? I can barely make a living on my own. I'll help you. I'll get a nanny. I'll give you money. I can't get a divorce, but I will recognize the child. Please don't have an abortion. Give me a little boy, my dear. I'll think about it, Jennifer said. And indeed, she thought for a long time. The girl went to the doctor, clarified the deadline by which she had to make a decision, and thought about what she should do. On the one hand, she realized that all the care of the child would fall on her. Mike would only be a Sunday dad. On the other hand, she loved this man so much that somewhere inside she was thinking I will give birth to his son. He will see how good we are together, and will definitely divorce, and come to live with me through the prism of his love. There was no way Jennifer could adequately evaluate her actions. She needed to consult someone, so she called Sandy, her best friend, who by that time already had a husband and a child. You're a piece of work, was the first thing her friend said when she heard the news from Jennifer. And who's the daddy? That's not the point. That's not the point. I'm not getting married. I want an abortion. And he's telling me to keep the baby. Are you crazy? What abortion? Of course you should have the baby. You don't know how happy it is to look at a little person who loves you for nothing. When I look at Mikey, I'm filled with love too. Sandy, you're married. What if I have a baby and I have to raise it alone in a rented apartment with a small salary? I can't afford it. Isn't your dad planning on helping out? They promised to provide. But I can't rely on that. I don't know what anyone's saying. I don't know, Jennifer. They say there's a bunny. There's a law and I can't support you in your decision to have an abortion. I look at Mikey and I think, how could this be? It wouldn't be such a miracle. Okay, thanks. At least I talked to someone. Come on, I'll keep thinking. I still don't think I should terminate the pregnancy. I haven't made up my mind yet. When Mike found out about Jennifer's pregnancy, he became even more alert and attentive. He came much more often and constantly asked what her plans were. In the end, the girl believed that the man would not abandon her with her son. And even without voicing the decision to herself, she as if by accident missed all the deadlines for abortion. When else can I have an abortion? she asked. Mike was very happy. I'm going to have a son, he murmured as he nursed Jennifer back to health, giving her money for doctors and vitamins and accompanying her to checkups. Jennifer was terrified of what would happen if she had a daughter, but at the next ultrasound, the doctor confirmed her father's hunch. You're having a son, mommy, she said to Jennifer lying on the couch. Jennifer smiled. I'm starting to believe that after the baby is born, things will get better. She took maternity leave from work, and the following spring Jennifer had a baby boy who looked a lot like Mike. She named her son Stephen. There was a dash in the father's name. I'm definitely going to adopt him, Mike said, but only a little later. Okay, sweetheart, look at the little guy. The older the boy got, the less often Mike showed up at Jennifer's house, and the less money he gave her. It got to the point where she couldn't afford to buy formula for her son. So she called the man she loved, why are you calling me? He got angry at the young mom. You don't realize that if I don't show up, it means I can't. And in general, I now have financial problems I cannot support another child. You gave birth to it. You have to raise it yourself. Oh yeah? You said we'd raise it together. I don't have enough allowance. I don't know what I said. I don't have time for you right now. I'll come if I can. Don't call me again. Jennifer sat by the baby's crib quietly holding back tears so as not to wake the baby. Well, what am I going to do, she thought. I shouldn't have trusted the man, no matter how sweet the promises he made. She felt bad for herself, for her son, and for the fact that she had been so foolish to rely on a complete stranger who had deceived her and was also rude. When the girl calmed down a little, she began to think about how to live on. Marilyn was very surprised to receive a call from her apartment at an unannounced time. Usually Jennifer only called her to inform her of a rent transfer. But now was clearly a different number. Oh, my heart smells something's up the woman thought as she picked up the phone. Hello, Jennifer. Marilyn, please excuse me. I'm having temporary financial difficulties right now. Could you please hold off on paying me this month? Oh, that's a shame. I've been planning what I'm going to use the money for, but I'll wait until a better time. Something came up. 
It's not a big deal. It's just that my paycheck's late at work. All right, Jennifer, just let me know when you send me the full amount. I will, Marilyn. Thank you so much. Goodbye, darling. Starling. The woman hung up the phone and, shaking her head, muttered. Something must have happened after all. Entering the room, Maxim asked her. What did you say? He had just arrived to help with the move to the dacha for the summer season. No, nothing. The girl who rents my apartment asked for an extension. She says she's behind on her paycheck. You know, I was thinking, I'll leave you her phone number. You check her out sometime. Mike, okay. Just make sure there's nothing wrong with it, nothing illegal. It's her first time filming, but there's a first time for everything. Marilyn, okay, son, don't worry, I'll take care of it. I've already taken her stuff out to the elevator, so it's time to get dressed. Marilyn went to her room to put her medication in her bag and dress warmly. It was a chilly start to summer. After talking to the landlady, Jennifer immediately pulled out the money she had set aside for rent, got dressed and went with the baby to the store to get formula. But this is only temporary, just for once she thought. What to do next? To get a job, you need a nanny. But what kind of nanny if I can't even buy pantyhose on my paycheck? When she returned with boxes of food for her son and put him to sleep in the stroller on the balcony, the girl picked up her phone and dialed a number. Emily, hello, I'd like to get off vacation next month. That's fine, Jennifer. We're waiting for you. But we're not getting any pay raises and we're running out of money. Yes, but I need a nanny to go to work. Well, I'm sorry, I can't make you happy. We're having problems at the company right now, even layoffs. You're lucky you're legally exempt, but frankly, it's not good. What if I go part-time and find a part-time job somewhere else? They won't fire me. Why would you and I have to go public with this? We won't tell anyone. And besides, you'll have child support. It's a small amount, but it'll be a better income. And, you know, I can write you a quarterly welfare check. I don't think it would be a bad idea. What about layoffs? The financial aid is under another article, so one can't interfere with the other. Oh, thank you, Emily. Then I'll come to work with you soon, of course. Jennifer worked as an assistant in the economics department. She had no specialized training. When she joined the company as a secretary, her smartness was quickly noticed, and she was offered the position with a small salary increase. Jennifer was pleased, because she preferred to work with papers rather than to meet people and prepare tea and coffee for the bosses. And the first person who helped her to get used to the new place was Emily, the head of the HR department. Jennifer was grateful to her and was always happy to come into her office. Now, after the conversation, she hung up the phone and felt ashamed of her request. But perhaps Emily was the only person in whose decency Jennifer was sure. In the evening, when the girl had just put her son to bed, the front doorbell suddenly rang loudly. Well, who has brought resented inwardly the girl? Son, after all, will wake up in her soul. There was still a lingering hope that Mike, who had not appeared or called for more than a month. On the threshold stood an unfamiliar man about 30 to 35 years old. Jennifer, hi. I'm Ben, Amber's son. Hi. Come on in. I'm sorry I didn't call. My mom left me your number. Well, I was just driving by, so I thought I'd stop by. Maybe you're home. Are you here for the money? I thought we agreed with your mom about an extension. No, I'm not here for the payment. She said she put it off. It's just that I took her to the cottage the other day and she asked me to stop by and see if I needed any help. A leaky faucet or a loose knob. It's an old apartment after all. That's when the baby cried in the room. Oh, wait a second, Jennifer rushed to her son. She rocked the baby's crib and he calmed down. You have a baby? Surprised son of the hostess. And here I was making a fuss. I woke him up. I'm sorry, but my mom didn't warn me. Jennifer lowered her eyes. When she'd met Amber, it had only been about renting an apartment. She'd said, oh, it's so nice that you're alone. No dogs or kids or anything like that. Otherwise, they'll trash the whole apartment, chew up the furniture. The kids will draw on the wallpaper. I'm alone, Jennifer laughed at the time. And I don't plan to have any dogs or kids yet. That's fine, the woman said. Then I'll be happy to rent you a place to live and she signed the contract. Son Jennifer answered Max's question. He's five months old. Your mom doesn't know yet. I didn't have the heart to tell her. 
congratulations. Are you going to live here as a family now, or are you going to move in with your husband? I don't have a husband, Jennifer said, and went all in. That's why I asked your mom to postpone the payment. I have nothing but my allowance right now. But I've already made a deal, and next month I'll start working. Then I'll be able to pay off my debt and keep paying. And who will take care of the child? The man asked. A nanny, probably, sighed the girl. But I haven't found one yet. They all ask for my salary for this, and I still have to pay you and feed my son something. But I'll definitely manage, don't you think? Just wait a bit, I'll pay you. I'm looking for a second job, maybe I'll clean the entrances of our house. Then I won't need a nanny. I can babysit for my neighbor. Can I sit down? Max asked, and without waiting for permission, settled on a bench in the hallway. And what do you work? Assistant economist. We have a good company. I've already talked to the head of the personnel department. She promised me a quarterly financial aid, and I can leave work early. How much do you expect to make, if it's no secret? Jennifer gave me a number. Do you think it's enough money for two people with a baby to live in a rented apartment? Max wondered. It will be difficult, but I can do it, she answered. Parents, relatives, friends, finally? Make the father pay child support. Jennifer shook her head negatively. He's married. He has two daughters. He didn't care about aesthetics. And when you decided to have a baby, excuse me, what were you thinking? Mike asked for a son and promised he'd help and adopt him. And you believed him? I see. Well, can we see the hero of this soap opera? Jennifer nodded and quietly led Ben into the room where the round baby was sleeping and smiling on the couch, covered with blankets so he wouldn't fall. The man couldn't hold back a smile, reached out a hand to him, then pulled it away and walked back out into the hallway. What am I going to do with you? He looked anxiously around the apartment. Jennifer. I think she'll be kicked out of the apartment soon. She asked quietly. Can I stay here for a couple more months? Till I find another place to live. I don't have anywhere else to go. Only to the street. No, I won't kick you out. I'm thinking about how to handle this situation. Let's do this. I won't say anything to my mom yet. For the next couple of months, I'll pay it myself and tell her as if you did it. But in return, you'll give me the coordinates of your work so I can see if you're telling me the truth. I'm sorry, but these are the times. Of course I understand. And then when you get a job, get a nanny and get your life together, then we can talk about payments again. Okay. Chuckles, thank you so much, Ben. I didn't expect you to be so understanding. I thought you'd just send me out the door. I want to help you regain your faith in people. Not everyone's a scoundrel like your Mike. He's not a scoundrel. He just can't leave his family for us. It's a testament to his integrity. Yeah, it's his integrity that made him choose to leave you. Okay, I hate to talk about him. Here's my phone number. If you need any help, call me and I'll try to solve the problem. Have a good day. The man walked out the door. Goodbye. And thank you again. Back home, Ben had dinner and tried to read the news on the internet. There was only one problem he didn't realize what he was reading because he was mentally going back to his conversation with Jennifer. No, it was understandable that a naive fool trusted some scoundrel. But how on earth does a guy like that get around? At home, he's probably a good family man, tells stories from work, goes for walks with his daughters, and does not think that someone can do the same to them when they grow up. And now she's got to get out of it. In a week to visit her, at least bring diapers and baby food. It'll be easier. But at the end of the week, Jennifer called. Hello, Ben. You said that if something broke, yeah, yeah. What's wrong, Jennifer? The washing machine. It's broken, and it won't heat the laundry. And I'm like a handicap without it, aren't I? But you understand. I understand perfectly. When will you be home tomorrow? All day. Where will I go? I haven't gotten a job yet, and I haven't found a nanny yet. I'll take the baby for walks. But if necessary, he can sleep in the stroller on the balcony. Right Ben's mind flashed. She needs a crib, too. Her son sleeps on her couch. Our old, beat-up couch, the one his father remembers. First of all, don't wait up for me. Just do your thing. Just make some room around the car. All right. Okay, I got it. Ben worked at a publishing house where most of the staff worked remotely. 
only occasionally coming into the office. However, they all shared a chat room where he'd thrown in the need for a crib. Within a couple hours, he received three offers to give it away for free with pictures. After looking at them carefully, he chose one. Ben drove up the same day and picked up the crib. In addition, he received several rattles, a pacifier, and other baby accessories. Heading to the office, he was pleased with the future surprise for Jennifer and her son. In addition, he also ordered a washing machine with delivery. To put in a new one, the old one was already more expensive to repair. Ben, did you get married? Jacob, an old acquaintance and editor of the publishing house, greeted him. No, why would you say that? What about the chat room newsletter? Or do you need this as a prop? No, it's not for me. It's just some girls I know who need help. Girls? But that means you're getting married soon, his colleague winked at him. I didn't think so, Ben smiled. On Saturday, as soon as the delivery guy called and said they'd be there in an hour and a half, Ben rushed to Jennifer's house. She was just feeding her son when he arrived, laden with a disassembled crib and other things. Don't get distracted by me, the young man said to the girl. I'll get everything out of the car, and only then I'll do the washing machine. Okay, Jennifer nodded, continuing to coax the baby to eat the applesauce she had just made from the last remaining apple, and in good conscience she should have had time to go to the store today. But she didn't bother telling Ben that. The man brought in all his things, undressed, and made his way to the room. Jennifer could hear him moving furniture from the kitchen and wondered, not realizing what he was doing. Maybe Amber asked me to find something, she thought. Then Jennifer heard the sound of an instrument, took her son in her arms, and went with him into the room. Ben had assembled the crib and fastened the sides to it. There was already a crib mattress and blanket inside. Ben, why? We were doing just fine without a crib. It's just a waste. You're not going to need a crib anytime soon, are you? At least until the age of two, a child shouldn't be ruining his spine sleeping on an unequipped couch. I didn't spend any money. My co-workers gave it to me for free. Their daughter had grown up. They didn't know where to put her. And a lot of other rattles. The man nodded at the big bag in the corner. And in the hallway, two packages of diapers. These are a gift from me. Put them back where you keep them. Oh, and by the way, there's a bunch of different jars of purees in there. I didn't know which ones you wanted, so I got a few different ones. But I see you've already eaten. Ben, thank you. But how am I going to pay you back? Why do you keep talking about money? You don't have to pay me back. They're all gifts. That's when the intercom buzzed. Here comes the washing machine. Today you'll have everything in perfect order. The movers lifted the machine to the floor, disconnected and took the old one. I decided it was easier to replace it than to repair it at the store. It's a promotion they take the old machine back to Recycle Field. So I saved money, Ben explained. Here's the manual for you to study for now. I'm going to go plug it in. By yourself. Jennifer was surprised. By myself, of course. It's a simple thing to do. Why waste money on installation? Three hours after Ben's arrival, the new, almost silent washing machine was running. Archie sat in the assembled crib, which Jennifer had made up, and played with the new rattles. The girl and her son were drinking tea in the kitchen. You see, the man smiled. Life is getting better, and when you get a job, it will be beautiful. But I can't find a nanny for reasonable money. They are all some governesses come across, who promise to talk to him in three languages, to teach him. And I just need to feed him and take him for walks, at least on the balcony. Maybe you're looking there today? Try among pensioners to look for those who have just gone on vacation. They still have enough strength and can watch the child, and their demands are not cosmic. Where to find them? You will not rush to every elderly person on the street with such a question. Ask at work. He and to do that you have to go out there. And I can't go out there until Step has settled in. It's a vicious circle. Let me ask my friends in the chat room if anyone has such acquaintances. I can't promise results. We've already found a crib. Maybe we can find a nanny too. Thank you, Ben, but I don't feel comfortable asking you. You've done so much already and we're nothing to you. You're my long-term investment. I'm interested in you keeping this apartment and paying rent. So consider it an investment in my secure old age. What old age? You're still a young man. That's something to think about when you're young. 
but I'm 32 now, so I'm not as young as you might think. I'm 23, she smiled. Oh, it's bedtime after all. I'm going to put him on the balcony. We'll go for a walk. Or maybe you and I will go for a walk in the park. He sleeps in the stroller there, and we'll go for a walk. Do you have time for that? Why not? It's the weekend. Get some fresh air? Jennifer started hesitantly. All right, then. You get dressed, Archie, and I'll get the stroller out, Ben said before she could finish. When Ben entered the office, he saw Jacob walking toward him with a smile. He's going to ask about getting married again, he braced himself. Ben, are you considering men as nannies? Ben hesitated. He and Jennifer hadn't discussed that option. I don't know that you want to offer yourself, he smiled back. What about publishing? No, I wouldn't mind. But I've got a lot of unfinished business to take care of, so I'll hold off for now. But I have an older brother, a retired lieutenant colonel in the security services, retired a long time ago. He used to work part-time, but now he says he's fed up. I want something more peaceful. He stayed at home for six months and howled. Kids are grown up, no grandchildren. He doesn't like technology. He used to like to go camping with the school. But now, to get a job there, you have to collect a lot of different certificates. And he's not in good health. Jacob continued. I was at home, humming at your message. He's excited about it. He wants to try it. Well, I don't know if taking care of a small child is a relaxing thing to do. So maybe you'll give it a shot. I'll talk to the baby's mom. Good, because I don't know how she'll react, Ben said. Sure, 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 sure. He has a car, by the way. He can bring it in and drive it if necessary. I can do that. Okay, I'll tell him. Robert was not only older than his brother, but taller and broader in the shoulders. He limped a little and came to meet the mother of a possible ward. When asked about the limp, the man always answered evasively. His car pulled into the backyard of the house with difficulty. Ben, of course, was also present. Jennifer's reaction to the suggestion of taking a man as a babysitter was calm. I guess we're just used to the nanny always being a woman, but a man can do the same thing. And it's definitely easier for him to carry a stroller with a baby. Let's get acquainted. If Archie's not scared, why not? Archie not only wasn't scared, but even smiled when the older man took him in his arms and touched his eyes and nose with his fingers. Wow, he's so cooperative. Robert laughed softly. So are we friends now? Archie started babbling something back and blowing bubbles. It was the first time Jennifer had ever seen a child react to a stranger in such a way, and she smiled. What about money? She asked the future babysitter, explaining the child's daily routine to him. Well, Jennifer, for me it's more pleasure than money. But I'm just getting a job. I can't even pay a full-time nanny at the average rate. So you'll pay half. Ben and I will talk about it. What's Ben got to do with it? The girl was surprised. He's my son and the nanny. But it's none of my business, Robert interrupted. I'm sorry for God's sake. I'm an old school man, and I simply can't take money from a woman, much less from such a charming girl. You'll talk to Ben about how much you're willing to pay me. He'll pay well. Otherwise, I'll take any amount. I understand a week, two weeks, a month. We'll see how it goes. This is new to me, too. My wife raised my kids. I was always on duty or on assignment. And now the kids are grown. My wife's gone. Oh, what am I talking about? So if my services suit you, and I realize that I can cope, then we'll discuss the final scene. And if not, I'm sorry. But I'll find someone else to replace me so you won't be left without a nanny. Thank you, Jacob Ben said. It's a deal. Can we do one more thing? Jacob asked. What's that? Just call me Bob. It's awkward. Are you much older? You can call me Bob, and you can call me Bob on a first name basis. That's what my wife used to call me when she was angry, he smiled. Alas, they've gotten a little crazy. That means I was wrong about something. Why wouldn't you be? Ben wondered. I don't know, it's just the way it's been since we met. They called me Rybakov at school and at the college too, or just Okop. She didn't like it, so she came up with a consonant. All right, we'll agree on that, Ben said. You'll just be grandfather to the baby. Is that okay? Of course it's okay. I don't think he'll understand it now. That's good. 
Why don't you show me how to pack for a walk and we'll go for a walk. You've got a nice park nearby. Bob with the stroller proudly stepped forward and behind him, Jennifer and Ben walked side by side taking their time. What do you think of the candidate? Ben asked. First impressions are very favorable. If he can handle the baby as well as he does during the day, I don't think we'll find a better old lady. I liked him too. He and his brother look alike, by the way. Only he struggled to find the words, but finally came up with one. What's his? Monumental. Reliable then? Jennifer smiled. Except I still don't understand why you're helping me. I explained it to you last time. It's a long-term investment, but seriously, I realize I can help. Why don't you? Especially since the labor is minimal. I'm the one paying him. If I find out you're paying, I'll find another apartment and leave. All right, all right. Don't worry. Everything will be just the way you want it. Finally, Jennifer went to work. First thing she did was go to Emily's with a box of chocolates. Oh, it's so good to see you, Jennifer. The woman was so happy. Come in, the candy is just in time. Now with you, we will drink tea and you tell me about your life. How is your baby? Did you find a nanny? I found one, the girl nodded. But the nanny is a man, ex-military or something else. I do not know, frankly speaking. He was so caring, memorized everything from the first time. He watches over the child. So sometimes I'm ashamed that I don't look like that. Anyway, we spent a month together looking at each other to see if we're right for each other. And? How's the kid reacting? He likes it a lot. He shuts up in Robert Alexeyevich's arms and sleeps peacefully. And where did you find such a treasure? Long story, Jennifer waved her hand. Kind people helped. That's right. There are more good people than there are good people. That's why you have to rely on them. How are things going at the company? No, I'm just retiring and handing things over. I briefly told my replacement about you. She says the new CFO is coming in. She'll take it up with him. Jennifer said the money for such help comes from the social fund. But in her opinion, that didn't convince Amber. So we're getting a new supervisor. I mean, how long can we go on without a CFO? I mean, we have his former deputy acting CFO. Apparently someone's not happy with him. They say they're looking for a new candidate. All right, apply while you still can. They'll get you the money. Thank you so much for everything and for them and for the human attitude Amber said. How long do you work until? Until the end of the month. And what are you planning to do after that a vegetable garden in the country Amber said, I don't like gardens. Mike laughed, you can quietly. And then you can not pull it out, yes. And the son, apparently it was passed on. He and his wife and daughter spend all summer. And I would rather be in the city in the parks to walk, cafes, go to the museum. Well, to be honest, I don't know yet, Dot. Why don't you come and visit us? You'll get to know each other. At least look at someone you actually saved with your help. Don't exaggerate. But if you invite us, we'll definitely drop by sometime. Can I write down your address? Or do you have a different one? No, it's still the same. You have your phone number. Call me if there's anything I can do for you. Thank you. I hope you don't need IT. Jennifer was sad all day. She had developed a very good relationship with the head of HR, and she was sorry to see her go. And these musings now and then thoughts of how she was going to get on with her life crept in. Well, nothing. The new boss will appear. I'll go to him myself, ask him. He's a human being. He should understand. We can try to look for another job. Maybe I should talk to Ben. I mean, come on, the slightest problem I have, I think he'll think I'm on his ass. I'll manage on my own. All these thoughts were interrupted by Archie's morning call, Jennifer. I'm sorry for God's sake, but I'm sick. It's been a long time since I've been sick. I'm actually very hardened. Temperature's 39 today. Well, I can't go to the baby's house in case it's contagious, sure. Sure, Jennifer reassured him. I'll take the day off work. Feel better. I really need you. And Archie even more, I'll make it quick. I'll make it quick. Okay. I'm sorry I let you down, no need to apologize, Archie. Well, you've been a great help to me for almost a year. Jennifer was about to object, but suddenly she ran out of steam. After losing part of her income in the form of financial aid, it would have been nice. But she was ashamed to even bring it up in front of herself. We'll talk about it later, she said into the phone. 
get well. That weekend, when Ben arrived and Jennifer complained to him about her forced vacation without pay, he asked, Do you want me to pay this month's bonus? Why are you all about the money? Jennifer replied, You'd better go over there and ask him how he's feeling. Although I think if I call him, he'll take it as a request to come see the baby sooner. Okay, I'll talk to him. Don't worry. Yes, I also cut my salary at work. Suddenly, the girl complained to him. How? Ben was indignant. They have no right. According to our labor laws, it's forbidden. Only if you reduce the working day. No, I had financial aid. Remember, I told you that the head of the personnel department wrote it out to me. Well, she retired, and the new one won't do it without the CFO's approval. And what? He said no. He hasn't started work yet. He's new. He'll start on the third. What if you go talk to him yourself? I've already thought about it. I guess I'll have a look at him to see if he's even in my position or not. Hang in there, Jennifer. Maybe you should look for another job. I've thought about that, too. But even looking at what I'm making in this position, I'm not being offered anything else. I'm not good at anything else. Jennifer, I want you to know that if you decide to quit, I'll help you out financially while you look for a new job. Ben, I already owe you everything. I don't even want to consider it. On Sunday, Emily came to visit. They sat in the kitchen and drank tea with a cake that the woman had baked for Jennifer and Archie. To be honest, I'm not much of a cook, but it's our family recipe. And everyone said it was delicious. Of course, maybe they're flattered, but it's better than store-bought Emily said. Emily, you really are an amazing hostess. Thank you so much, Jennifer said. How's retirement life treating you? You know, I was worried it would be boring. But now I don't even have any free time. I was saving time for you at 12 today. Didn't you promise to introduce him to my boy's toy? Archie brought the woman all his toys and showed her how to play with them. Emily didn't get to play with him until Jennifer took him out to rest. Come, come, I'll do the dishes here, the woman told her. Oh, come on, don't. Yes, you do. You should rest too. When Archie was asleep, the women settled down in the kitchen. And Emily said seriously, Actually, I've come for one more thing. I want to warn you about your future boss. They say he's an excellent specialist, but he's not much of a man, but I don't know him personally. It's just a rumor. But you should be careful about opening up to him. Let HR ask him for you. Okay, Jennifer shrugged. What can he do? The only thing he can do is fire me. But then he'd have to pay severance. I don't know what he'll do, but don't trust him. Okay. I promise everything will be fine, Emily, don't worry. At that moment, Jennifer heard the sound of a key in the keyhole and the door opening. I wonder who it is. The girl thought, stepping out into the hallway. Ben and Jacob were the only ones with keys. Ben wouldn't have arrived without a call. Jacob then. Jacob stood on the doorstep. Jennifer. I'm sorry, for God's sake, he whispered. I know Archie's asleep at this hour, and I didn't call so I wouldn't wake him. It's okay, she nodded. Why are you here? Because of Amber. I feel guilty. I wish I could give you half a day off. Jacob walked into the kitchen and stopped in the doorway. I didn't realize you had company. Hello, I'm honored to introduce myself. Jacob, he stood in front of Emily. Emily, she smiled and gestured him to a chair. Please have a seat. Archie and I just met today. She looked at Jennifer with a smile. Emily and I worked at the same company, and we decided to meet today. I hope I'm not interrupting anything. Of course not, the woman smiled and set the third mug on the table. So you two aren't working together anymore? Jacob asked. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I'm retired. Emily lowered her eyes flirtatiously. Jennifer grinned at the spectacle being played out in front of her by people twice her age. What's there to be ashamed of? I've been retired for 15 years, and I'm not ashamed of it at all. I can say of such a fine lady that retirement is the beginning of life, Jacob said. I was just telling Jennifer that I don't have much free time yet. I'm reading books, learning computer programs, going on field trips. You know, all the things I've been putting off for so many years because of work. How did your family feel about that? Jacob asked. What family? Emily waved her hand. Her husband had passed away a long time ago, and the children were grown, independent. I don't like that. 
I don't like that. No, well, you speak my words. I slap myself on the knee. God with it, I understand you perfectly well. And she listened to the conversation between her older friends and found much in common. Then Archie woke up and she retired to her son's room, leaving the two of them alone. Jennifer, we thought we'd go for a walk, Jacob asked her, peering into the room. Do you mind? Of course not. Don't you need me, Jennifer? The man winked at her. There's no third person. I thought the third was Archie Jennifer also smiled. The children are beyond competition. It was at this time that the baby saw his babysitter and reached for him. The morning newsletter at work delighted Jennifer with the news, dear colleagues. You are invited to join us today at 11. Double zero AM in the conference room. There will be an introduction to the new CFO of our company. He will tell you about the principles of his work and discuss further plans for the development of our company. Well, at last rejoiced the girl. At least some certainty. And then to live with the unknown tomorrow is worse than ever. There was excitement in the women's restroom. All the young female employees were tidying up before the meeting to seduce him. Are we going to do it in a bunch, the married ladies asked them. Or is he single? Married. Married confirmed one of the girls. But they say he's no stranger to the female sex. You can be a mistress to begin with. And then, who knows, suddenly you'll be a wife. Jennifer only chuckled inwardly as she listened to these conversations. She'd been down this road, and it hadn't ended well. No, of course I have Archie, and that's fine. But the rest of it, no way, just strictly business negotiations, she thought to herself. Free or quit. At 11.10, the conference room hummed quietly like a beehive as the CEO walked in, followed by William. Jennifer closed her eyes in surprise. Sorry I'm late, the CEO said. I'd like to introduce you to our new manager, Mike. He is now in charge of all financial matters. And thank goodness. Because frankly speaking, I'm tired of your wishes, he smiled. Please, Mike, you have the floor. Hello, Mike stood next to the chair and slowly looked around the room. First of all, let me say that my lateness today is an unforgivable oversight. I believe that all of us should work with the precision of a Swiss watch, as a single mechanism. That means no tardiness, no, no leaving early and no excuses. Only a doctor's note can influence the decision to take disciplinary action. And that, please note, frequent illness indicates that you do not take good care of your health. And with such we will not be on the way. The hall whispered the new chief started his speech too harshly. You will ask all the questions later, he continued, interrupting some employees who raised their hands to clarify some points. Secondly, and then William hesitated, meeting Jennifer's eyes. The girl sat staring at him without taking her eyes off him. Nothing betrayed the emotions that raged in her soul. And it was not hatred, contempt, or even pity. No, she suddenly realized to herself that it was love. A hard, dependent, unreachable love that forgave him for everything he had done to her life. And if she were asked now if she would repeat that path, she would repeat that path, she would undoubtedly answer in the affirmative. William was still saying something. Jennifer looked at him and realized how much she had missed him in the partial couple of years she hadn't seen him. It was one thing to not see a person and quite another to have them reappear in your life and seemingly faded feelings suddenly rekindle. After the meeting, everyone went to their workplaces. Since the economics department reported directly to the new director, Mike's office was in their wing, right next to Jennifer's. Jennifer sat quietly at her desk and tried to concentrate, but all her thoughts were on him. That's when her phone lit up a text from Mike came in. Tomorrow at nine in my office, Jennifer couldn't believe her eyes. Reread the message and replied, Okay, then tried to tune in to work. All night she had hardly slept at all. Jennifer would get up, walk over to her son's bed and smile, thinking, we're definitely going to be okay now she was sure Mike wouldn't say no to her. After all, this was his only son too. Jennifer pondered what to wear to the meeting to look both businesslike and attractive, but came up with nothing. As she was getting ready in the morning, she found a short black skirt in her closet that she had once worn on dates with him and decided to wear it. Wow. Jennifer, are you going to a business meeting today? The mirror on the wall asked. Yes, a very important one, she nodded. Well, good luck then. You look great, a real modern businesswoman. Jennifer smiled and drove to work. Come in. Mike jumped up and locked the office door behind her, so we wouldn't be interrupted. So you work here? Yes, she nodded. How did you end up at our company? Weren't you a financial analyst? 
Well, it's not far from one or the other. Circumstances worked out. It's good to see you. You're still running in the park, looking great. No, I'm not up to it right now, but hopefully I'll be able to resume training soon. Great, have a seat. He pointed to the couch. Tell me about your life. How's Archie? So he's interested in his son, too Jennifer thought. It didn't matter what his circumstances were. He's fine, he's growing up. We're planning to start kindergarten soon. And now with a nanny, Jennifer didn't go into details. Wow, you can afford a nanny? Your salaries are pretty good. Jennifer sighed. I've been meaning to talk about you. She hesitated when she felt his hand on her shoulder. Mike moved closer and whispered hotly in her ear. I thought it had passed, but no. I want you so much. You're still beautiful, beautiful and free. Jennifer's head was spinning. She tried to pull away, but it only made her more attracted to him. I want you too, she said tonelessly. Do I have a favor to ask? Mike pulled away. Jennifer opened her mouth, but he exclaimed. No, don't say anything yet. I have an idea, let's play boss and secretary. He lifted her off the couch and dragged her to the middle of the office. I am the formidable boss. Are you afraid of me? Tell me what you want. Could you give me a raise? Jennifer said timidly, not believing this game. What? I can't hear you. Louder raise my salary. She repeated a little more clearly. But is that any way to talk to the boss? You address him as you, you beg him, and then you do whatever he says. A doubt stirred in Jennifer's soul. She froze. Well, what about you? Mike grinned. It's just a game. Let's give it a try. Come on, express your desire. Give me a raise. Boss Jennifer said loudly. But don't order it. You have to beg for it. See what the boss said. Take your skirt down. You're a subordinate, so take it off. Not like that. More erotic. How do you do it? You need me to do your bidding. So follow my instructions. Jennifer began to slowly remove her skirt, entering the game. Dear boss, please give me a raise. Why is that? Me and my son Archie will soon have nothing to eat. But any favor requires a return favor. You understand, don't you? And I'm prepared to do you one. Just please give me a raise. Jennifer was so into the role that a tear rolled down her cheek. She realized that she really wanted to cry and tell Mike everything she had been through since he left. After these thoughts, tears came to her eyes from weakness or self-pity. Mike couldn't take it anymore and ran up to the half-naked girl. He was so aroused that he easily entered her and poured all the accumulated passion, standing on the carpet. Then he picked her up in his arms and carried her to the couch. They enjoyed each other's intimacy for a few more minutes. Soon the man stood up. Time for work, he smiled at Jennifer. She nodded and began to clean herself up. All week her soul had been singing from her newfound love. Jacob noticed her mood. Are you in love by any chance, Jennifer? Why are you suddenly asking that? It's just that I've never seen you in such a beautiful mood before. It's like you're glowing from the inside out. No, Jacob, I didn't tell him my secrets. It's just that life is getting better, little by little. Whatever it is, I'm infinitely happy for you. I hope there will be room in this life for me as your old acquaintance. Undoubtedly. But just don't emphasize the word old Jennifer smiled. You have a fine age. If I had been told that before I met you, I would probably have started to refute the fact. However, a lot has changed since then. He winked enigmatically at his ward's mother. The next week, the meeting in the office was repeated, and so did the game. Although it didn't feel so new, Jennifer was more in character now, and her closeness to Mike was back on her mind. Two weeks later, her boss left on a business trip, and Jennifer waited impatiently for his return until payday. Then she received money even less than usual. The girl came to the accounting department with a question. Mike was the one who told everyone to cut off their overtime pay, she was told. Everyone, all of them, the girls nodded. Jennifer was upset, but decided to wait until Mike arrived to clear the air. When the two of them were alone in the office again, she didn't get flirtatious and joined in the game. I got a very small paycheck here. The girls in accounting said it was your order. Yes, I told them to remove overtime pay for all employees. You work here, so that means it affects you too. But why is it your fault that you don't get everything done on time? 
Why should the company's money go to that? Mike, but I told you. I don't have enough money to live alone with Sandy. Right now the paycheck is below the market average. Didn't you promise me you'd give me a raise? I promised when here we are, the two of us together here when we were playing and loving each other. It's just a game. Well, you just said yourself that we were playing. Who said it was serious? But even so, haven't you realized that your son Archie and I need money? Everyone needs money. As the CFO, I know that for a fact. For that matter, you asked for it. But I didn't promise anything. I also said, do what the boss says, quid pro quo. That's the rules of the game, which we both enjoyed, by the way. That's me, isn't it? I could see you wanted me out. Two, I made you feel good. And we live by very different rules. So you just used me, and in doing so, you cheated on me. But you used my body too. Or did you do it for money? Here's the raise I supposedly promised you. Jennifer placed the resignation letter in front of him. Sign it, she demanded. You're talking to your boss in an inappropriate tone. You're not my boss anymore. So sign the letter, and I'll quit, Jennifer insisted. Mike got up from his desk, walked over and closed the door again. If you keep harassing me, I'll file a rape report with the police. Well, why be so rude? I mean, we know each other well. We even have a son. You should have thought of your son when you signed the payroll. I'm doing this for the company, not for my own personal interests. That's why I'm leaving, so you don't confuse the two, Jennifer said. What about me? Aren't you going to find yourself another fool? Don't you realize I'm having a good time with you? And I think you are too Mike objected. It was good, but it's gone. You can't fool me indefinitely, Jennifer said. Ugh, what a word deceive. I didn't fool anyone. You're the one who made it up. Both my promises and my deceptions, Mike objected. Are you going to sign a letter of resignation? Well, if you want to quit, sure. But why don't you take a look at this first, he pointed to his screen. And what's this I'm going to see? Are you going to promote me after all flashed through her mind? Why don't you take a look? Jennifer walked over to the chair and looked at the monitor. At that moment, Mike started up the video files. They showed Jennifer herself evolving in the center of the office, on the carpet, as if to music, almost like a professional dancer. She watched in horror as she removed all her clothes and underwear from below her waist, then stretched her arms toward Mike, who approached her, as if reluctantly, with his face distorted beyond recognition. Her face can be seen clearly, alas, not just her face. It's impossible to tell from the man who it is. You sneaky bastard. So you were also filming us. From where Jennifer exclaimed. What are you talking about? It's just CCTV cameras. They're in every office. You have to take and sign an order from the CEO and then take the footage. You can do whatever you want with them. Jennifer lowered her eyes. There are plenty of programs for processing video files. Say that worked out well, didn't it? Didn't you ever want to be an actress? All girls usually want to, and a lot of guys too. You definitely have talent, Mike said. And what do you think your new employer will say when he sees this? I won't tell you where you'll be working. Trust me, it's not hard to find out at all. You could put it on the internet and you'd be a porn celebrity. That's not a bad prospect either. Then every man in town will recognize you and make lewd propositions. So are you going to sign the application or are you going to stay after all? When it's just me watching this movie. It's one of my favorites, by the way. I've memorized all your little gestures from it, Mike continued. You want me and Archie to starve to death on the street. How can you think that about me? I'm just calculating all the options so you can't disappear from my sight. And what are we going to live on? Well, you've lived somehow before, so you'll continue to do so. So how about a statement? Jennifer grabbed a paper off her desk with anger, tore it up and threw it in Mike's face. Then she walked out of the office and slammed the door loudly, then left the office for a nearby cafe and, locking herself in the bathroom, cried for a long time from her own powerlessness and anger at herself for being so deceived. After a while, Bob walked into the cafe. Hi, sorry to be so abrupt, but do you know what happened to our Jennifer? Hello, Bob. No, what happened? She was so cheerful and then she's abruptly withdrawn, walking around moody. And there's only food in the house for Archie. I haven't seen her in a long time, is she sick? After that walk with Archie, Bob and Emily exchanged phone numbers. 
The man tried not to be annoying, but sometimes called for the most unexpected reasons. For example, when he learned delicious and quick recipes for cooking potatoes, he thought that Emily didn't like to cook either. And here's 15 minutes in the microwave and such a delicious meal finger licking good. Or he shared news from the publishing industry, which his younger brother regularly supplied him with. Alex told me that Shaposhnikov has a new book out. It is already planned to screen. Not interested in his work. Emily, in turn, also shared with him discoveries made on excursions or simply in her now quiet new life. And when the weather was nice, they would also meet in the park, walking and smiling at each other when they were called grandparents, and then laughing contagiously while sitting on a bench. Well, of course, if Archie calls me grandpa, then I'm grandpa to everyone. Not being grandpa would be bad, Bob said one day. How's that Emily didn't understand? It's very simple, isn't it? I'd be a grandfather if he called me grandpa. But Archie calls grandfather that word, according to the rules of the Russian language, would be in the genitive case. Who? Grandfather. And forgive my nerdiness. Anyway, if I'm a grandfather, or even a grandfather, then since you're walking with me, you're a grandmother. I called the girls I know at my old job and found out they'd gotten a pay cut. Maybe that's why Jennifer is so upset. She just doesn't have enough money. I've told her how many times she can stop paying me, but she adamantly refuses to listen to me. Jennifer tried to refuse Emily when she called to say she was going to visit. The girl was ashamed to invite to her practically beggar's house, but the woman had insisted, and Bob had also said more than once that it would be good to meet and sit together. With the last money she had saved, Jennifer tearfully bought tea and rusks and prepared for the guests. Bob and Emily came in together. Can you believe it, Jennifer, we met at the front door. Here to help carry the bags, Bob said. They started taking chicken and canned goods, jam and cakes out of the bags. I'm sorry, Jennifer said to the guest. I didn't have time to cook at all, so I ran to the store and bought a few little things. Well, Emily, it looks to me like you bought the whole store in small change. What are we going to do with all this? Or are you going to live with me now? Jennifer smiled and looked at Jacob. I wonder why that idea never occurred to me before. Me neither, he said, surprised. Jennifer, I was just talking to my girls over tea, the former colleague said. They claim that the new boss has removed overtime. Yes, the girl nodded sadly. He says it's our own fault for not getting everything done during working hours. So the company doesn't have to pay us extra. I'm sorry, but I know your salary, Emily said. How are you going to live now? Maybe it's time to change jobs. Jennifer couldn't explain to good, albeit good, strangers how her father had naively caught her on the hook and that now she couldn't change jobs. I tried, she lied, but I couldn't find anything suitable. So I thought you might need help, Emily continued. So I talked to some people I know. There are at least two places that will hire you at one and a half times your salary. Maybe you could try interviewing there. Jennifer realized that it was impossible to refuse, so she nodded. Yes, of course, I'll definitely go. Thank you for your concern. Mike realized the power he now had over his subordinate and began to invite her into the office and tried to harass her there. If you are not with me, the video will be seen by everyone, he reminded the girl every time. So far, Jennifer had managed to come up with good reasons for refusal, whether it was an illness or an important meeting. But she was well aware that soon all these excuses would cease to work. And even if he started raping her, Jennifer would have nothing to defend herself with. That upset her even more. The girl felt like she was being sucked into a swamp she couldn't get out of. But she was already so tired of this tension that she was ready to wave her hand and give up. Then Ben showed up after hours. He usually came once or twice a month, spending some time with Jennifer, Archie, and Jacob. If he was on site, sometimes the four of them would all go for a walk and Ben would leave. This time he arrived late at night after work when Jacob was gone. Archie was asleep, and Jennifer was lying on the couch watching some channel on the TV thinking about something of her own. Ben entered the apartment so quietly that Jennifer found him when he was already standing in the room. Oh, hi, she smiled. Did something happen? Yes, the man nodded. We need to talk. Let's go to the kitchen. When they sat down at the table, he continued. Jacob came to see me. He gave me a long explanation about Emily, about the empty refrigerator, about your paycheck being cut. All I got out of it was that for some reason you wouldn't leave this job, even though you had other good offers. I'm not retracting what I said about helping you, but I still want to ask why. 
Is it your desire to sit on the neck of others, or is there some other reason? And abruptly, patience burst, and Jennifer nodded. There are. But when am I going to tell you about them? I can't. It would be like I'm putting my problems on you again. And besides, I'm really, really embarrassed. Ashamed of what? My behavior, my naivete, the fact that I'm using you and Jacob. Even though I know exactly how bad it is and that it's wrong. So you feel guilty. And that's why you refuse to tell me everything. Jennifer nodded again. Then imagine that tomorrow Jacob and I were gone. You'd be alone with your secret. What would you do? I don't know. I'd throw myself in front of a train, she said sadly. So you're ready to give up your life, but you're not ready to share it with me. Jennifer sighed and said softly, I'm being blackmailed. Ben was questioningly silent. If he had asked clarifying questions or inquired, the girl would probably have withdrawn. But he remained silent and looked expectantly at Jennifer. My new boss. Jennifer closed her eyes and said in a muffled voice, He's Archie's father. Ben had a thousand questions. How can you blackmail the mother of your child when you don't live with them and haven't even acknowledged your son? But he restrained himself and continued to remain silent. Jennifer sighed and began to tell. When he came, he summoned me, and we were together again. He was so attentive. Then he cut everyone's pay by canceling overtime. And when I wanted to quit, he showed me a video. Tears came out of the girl's eyes. He recorded everything. He had video surveillance. He hid himself, but I'm on it in great detail. He said he'd send it to his employer or put it on the website so everyone would know what I was like. How's Archie gonna grow up with a mom like that? And he knows where we live. And I'm afraid that if I quit, he'll be watching me. He's cut my pay here, and he's always calling me to his office. He makes himself patient, he tries, but I still find reasons to refuse. This can't go on much longer. I'll either have to accept it, or... It's none of my business, but I want to understand why you want to be with him again, after he left you and your son Ben interrupted. I saw him for the first time in almost two years, and I realized I still loved him. He was all attentive, just like the first time. I thought he'd come back to us. There's nothing like that on any show. You should really get out of there and run for your life. I'm ready to, but I can't. Do you still love him? Jennifer looked up at Ben with tears in her eyes. I hate him. I'd probably kill him. He disgusts me. I shake every time I hear his voice, and even when he calls me into the office. So I take it you're willing to walk away if he stops threatening to release the video? Of course I lie awake nights thinking about how to do it, but I can't think of anything. It's either kill him or kill myself. Either way, Archie will be an orphan. The girl cried again. I told you that you could come to me for help. Why didn't you do it right away? I was fine at first. And when the tape came out, I'm ashamed, Ben. I mean, you're a stranger in this. Did it ever occur to you that blackmail is a felony? I mean, you can punish him yourself, threaten him with the police, after all. Jennifer tried to explain herself. She said that Mike had threatened to spread the videotape and then she'd get good lawyers. She's still going to lose, the scoundrel. Okay, let's see who else loses. Sandy's advice was to go to the clinic on Monday and take a sick day. But that meant less income. But it'll get your nerves back in order. Yes, it's difficult, but you can't say no at this time. Jennifer had a question. Out of what funds was Sandy paying God's mom? Jennifer took out a loan. How would she pay it back? Jennifer shrugged her shoulders. She doesn't. She doesn't have the means to pay it back. If she loses her job, she won't lose anything. But if she changes jobs, how? That's something to think about. When Jennifer went on sick leave, she realized that Ben was right about one thing. She was much calmer. She was out of the circle of constant unpleasant thoughts. The girl was listed in the company, but she was protected from Mike's attacks and threats, and she still didn't know what she would do next. Right now she had a break, and it was helping Jennifer recover a little. On Saturday, Ben, Jacob, and Emily showed up on the doorstep of Jennifer's apartment. Jennifer, get Archie ready to go for a walk Jacob ordered. Emily will go to the park with him, and they will stay behind. They have much to discuss. Without raising her eyes, the girl dressed her son and handed him over to the care of her former co-worker. 
As the door closed behind them and everyone else made their way to the kitchen, Ben said, I'm sorry, but I had to tell Jacob something. We can't do this without his help. Don't worry, girl, I've brought more scoundrels to light, the older man said. I've been investigating for over 20 years for a reason. Jennifer looked at Jacob, you. Yeah, didn't you know? I thought you were ex-military. There are no exes like me, he smiled. Now let's discuss our actions. The same day Jennifer returned from her sick leave, she got a call from Mike. Please come into my office in an hour. Okay, Mike. I'll come over, the girl said, so that those around her could hear her. She sorted out the files left over from her absence. Then she wrote an email, replied in Messenger, and then took the first folder she could find and walked with a business-like stride to her boss's office. Knocked on the office, heard a loud come in and opened the door. Come in, come in, Mike, as usual, got up from his seat and went to lock the door behind the girl. She turned around and watched intently while he did so. I brought you some, she began. The man pointed to the nightstand. You can pick it up later. Where have you been for so long? I missed you so much. He began to come closer and closer. Jennifer could barely contain the unpleasant shiver. Finally, his hands touched her clothes. He left the jacket in place, ran his hands lower down her stomach to her skirt. You dress like that for me today. Do you want what I want? The girl remained silent, and Mike took it as agreement. When he was about to unzip her skirt, Jennifer suddenly said in a harsh voice, Don't do that. I don't want to. Well, what do you want, you silly girl? After all, I can see it. I want you. No, you're wrong. I'm asking you to let me go and sign my resignation letter. Mike recoiled sharply from her what, or is my memory gone? I still have the video on my desktop. Two clicks of the mouse and everyone around here will know what you're like. I'm not. Yeah. But only I know that. And I'm not going to tell anyone. I can keep a secret. Especially when there's an obedient girl around. Come on, don't be stubborn. We'll be good together. And he reached for her again, signed the application. And then you'll be undressing already. Are you serious? You think that's going to stop me? I'm serious, Mike. There's my statement on the nightstand. Sign it and then do what you want. What if I want you? I said you want me. Then it was a deal. Mike took the paper, put his sprawling signature on it, and put it back. But you'll only go to the nightstand through me and what I want, he said. And when you and I are done and you leave your workplace, I will, as I said before, send the video to all interested parties. That will guarantee that when I come to visit you and your son, you won't kick me out. Why is that? because I'll be the only person who knows the truth about you. Everyone else will turn away, and then you'll belong to me. Isn't it enough that I'm with you now? Why send out more videos? Jennifer asked. Just once? No, of course not. I want you to be with me as long as I want you to be with me, and only with me, so no one else will ever come near you. But you have a way out in a statement, just like last time. And no one but you and me will know about the existence of this erotic masterpiece. Saying this, Mike walked over to the girl and started undressing her. Jennifer didn't move and thought, but suddenly a siren sounded and the internal radio came to life. Attention. Fire alarm. Evacuation. Everyone, evacuate the building immediately. Please do not use elevators, take the stairs. Attention. Fire alarm. What the hell? Mike swore, looking at the radio. I thought it wasn't working. Thank God it does, Jennifer smiled inwardly. That's what I thought. There was a knock on the office door. Mike, out. There's a fire. Jennifer began to quickly pull up her skirt, which Mike had managed to unbutton. He grabbed his briefcase and ran to the door, opened it and sprinted out of the office. Jennifer calmly went to the nightstand, picked up the application, and also, without hurry, went away. The play is over, she thought as she walked down the stairs with everyone else. While the firemen were inspecting the building and allowing everyone to return to their workplaces, Jennifer stealthily got into Ben's car, which was parked around the corner, and drove to the police station. There she wrote a statement, attached evidence, and returned to the office. Two hours afterward, a police car pulled up to the building. Three officers got out, showed their documents, and went up to the floor where the CFO's office was located. 
There they showed them. But he's not here right now. It doesn't matter to us, replied one of the policemen. What's the matter? The CEO approached as the uniformed men were taking the system unit out of Mike's office. Don't interfere with the investigation. One of them pushed him away with his hand. But there are trade secret documents in there. I sympathize. Are you interfering with the work of the police right now? The director backed off. No, I just wanted to understand what happened. The mystery of the investigation. Perhaps your employee will tell you. He's not back yet. All the worse for him. After lunch, Jennifer took her boss's signed application to HR. Mike apologized profusely for losing it in the paperwork. But here it is, signed two weeks ago. So have my paperwork ready starting tomorrow. I don't work here. We won't have time for that, the HR girl said. But it's not my problem. Make a note in the employment record. I can't give it to you. Send an order to the accounting department so that they made the calculation. I'll come back for the rest later. I've got some paperwork to get to my new job. Before leaving, Jennifer once again looked in the personnel department, took her documents, and with a victorious smile left the office. My girl, you're just a born actress, were the words that greeted Jennifer Jacob when she got home from work. I've seen the video, there's no doubt about blackmail, harassment, and a couple of other questionable actions. And if they can find something on the computer for the Economic Crimes Unit to pick on, this scumbag won't have a care in the world to get his ass out of the shit she's in. Thank you. Such a great hidden camera on your jacket lapel and good quality recording. The girl smiled at him. Of course, it's a little illegal. Jacob sighed. But my former subordinates won't cling to such trivialities either. When Ben told Jacob about Jennifer's situation, he was indignant. Why didn't you tell me before? Who would do something like that right away? So much time had been wasted because of that. He got miniature recording devices hidden in a woman's brooch through former colleagues. He contacted the fire inspector on behalf of the investigation team and detailed a scenario for the main character. Jennifer, your number one job is to report to me as soon as you go into the office. And task number two is to stall for time without giving him a chance to jump you. Okay, I don't know how I'm going to do that. I want to tear him into a thousand little pieces. I'm sure for your future, and more importantly Archie's future, you'll be able to contain yourself, will you? Jennifer smiled. I'll try. The rest was a matter of technique getting the fire alarms to go off, kicking everyone out of the building, arranging time with the investigator to take a statement and camera footage, sending a team to confiscate the computer. It took a little longer than planned. But by the end of the day, it was clear that Ben and Jacob had managed to get the girl out of the trap that love trust and perhaps her own stupidity had put her in. Jennifer got a job at one of the companies she was invited to on Emily's recommendation and gradually began to come to her senses and pay off her loan debt. This is called Sophia Loren Amber led Jacob over to a dark maroon rose in her makeshift rose garden. I can see why the man smiled. So much dignity and beauty. Yes, the woman agreed. And the burrow is the same, requires more care than others. Let's go to the table. Well, did you take a walk in the garden? Emily looked at Jacob, smiling. Oh, and by the way, I was introduced to Sophia Lauren. What did you say? I said she was beautiful, but my heart went out to another woman. I said she was beautiful, but my heart went out to another woman. I wonder who that is? You, my Amber, he concluded, hugging the woman. I see all the men at the grill are crazy about her, Emily laughed. At that moment, Archie ran up to Amber. Grandma Emily, let's go. Let's go where, dear? The child waved his hand uncertainly. The older woman took him by the hand, and the baby led her to the honeysuckle table, where Jennifer was gathering treats for the table. Golden boy. Jennifer, why did you keep him a secret for so long? I was afraid you wouldn't like the fact that I had a baby. After all, you only rented the apartment to me. No kids, no pets. Remember? I remember, and I'm not going back on my word. But I'm not so old that I don't realize that life moves on and changes will happen. Your Archie is like a grandson to me. I don't know if Ben will ever give me one of his. Amber looked at her son, who was grilling kebabs by the grill and talking to Alec. I asked to come Jacob's brother explained. I wanted to see who you were buying the baby clothes for, 
but also his brave mother, of course, who wasn't afraid to take Jacob as her son's nanny. Don't you have a reason to change your plans now? Ben obediently began turning the kebabs. If I were a dozen years younger, he continued, I would definitely follow your charming mother. And if I were younger, then for the mom of this charming baby. I don't see what you have to lose. Ben lifted his head, looked at Jennifer and waved back at her. The girl sent him an air kiss. He traced the gestures with his eyes and sighed. Well, that just leaves your mom. <laughs>